Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all my colleagues in the Executive Committee of Dubai Pediatric Club and on behalf of all my colleagues in Dubai Pediatric Club, I would like to welcome all viewers from Dubai, UAE, GCC countries and all countries throughout the world. Today, we have eminent speaker and panelists, two from India, Dr. Debadatta Mukhapadia and Dr. Rashid uh, uh, from India. We have eminent uh, pediatric cardiologists uh, from UAE, Dr. Muhammad Suleiman, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Sufi, and Dr. Samir Sajbani. Well known to all of you in a short while, I'll be uh, introducing them. This webinar is semi accredited and is in collaboration with NMC Specialty Hospital Dubai, and uh, it is sponsored by uh, Vita Biotics UAE. I would like to thank the country business manager of this company, Mr. Tofi Ali, as always supporting us. Well, there is a question for all audience. You have two minutes time to, the question has two parts. Who is this gentleman? And why in ECG, the letters PQRST is chosen? Why not other letters? So you have two minutes time to tell the winner will be announced and token of appreciation will be given. Beautiful Dubai, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I would like to request all those who have not seen, come and see this beautiful city. Expo is there till end of this month. Members of Dubai Pediatric Club, on behalf of all of them, and members of the executive committee of Dubai Pediatric Club, I would like once again to welcome all viewers to this webinar. Uh, in the executive committee, myself, Dr. Joshi, the past president, Dr. Kalpana Sengupta, the secretary, Dr. Diari Mohammed, chairman of the academic affair, Dr. Amir, <coughs> Mohammed Amir Toleimat, he is our moderator today, Dr. Ayman Jundi, Dr. Rafi Awara, Dr. Srinivas Bandari, Dr. Leila Rahi, and Dr. Khaled Rashid. Well, today, as I mentioned, we have eminent speakers and panelists from India and the UAE. Our speaker is Dr. Debadatta Mokobadia, <coughs> senior consultant pediatric cardiologist and associate professor of pediatrics at the West Bengal University of Medical Sciences and affiliated to other hospitals in Calcutta. She is very well known in pediatric circle in Dubai. She has been our speaker in annual conference. We have also with us <coughs> Dr. Rashid, a pediatric cardiac surgeon from India, Calcutta. He's attached to Podar and Amri hospitals in Calcutta, and he is very well known there. We have with us also Dr. Mahmoud Sufi, senior consultant pediatric cardiologist at Ad Jalila Children's Hospital, Dubai. Dr. Muhammad Suleiman, Senior Consultant Pediatric Cardiologist at Kids Hearts Medical Center, Dubai, UAE. He's joining us from Egypt tonight. Dr. Samir Sajwani, very well-known Senior Consultant Pediatric Cardiologist, attached to many hospitals at present at the Suleiman Al-Habib Hospital. We have two moderators, Dr. Kalpana Sengupta, Senior Specialist Pediatrician, Head of Department of Pediatrics at NMC Specialty Hospital, Secretary of the Club, and Dr. Amir Mohammad Tolaymat, the member of the Executive Committee. Well, I would like to announce here that we will have our annual conference, eighth annual DPC conference on 26th and 27th of November, in two days with more than 35 presentation detail will be announced. Well, I would like to bring into attention of our viewers, we have a YouTube channel, DPC annual conferences, all our conferences, webinars, symposia, all of there, you can see the recordings. Well, uh, Mr. Tofir Ali, our sponsor since 2050, he's been felicitated by the founder of the Bay Pediatric Club, Dr. Led Kuhi. Well, I would like to give a brief history of pediatric cardiology. I always start with the memory of Hippocrates, the father of medicine, Al Razi, the father of pediatrics, who described measles in 10th century, father and mother of pediatric cardiology, Helen Dossing and Alexander Nadas, pioneers of pediatric cardiology. Well, the answer to the question, now I would like to request Fadi to start receiving the if somebody has answered. 
This is Eindhoven, the father of electrocardiography. Well, now I'll tell you why this ECG called the uh, a PQRST. See, when Eindhoven, of course, before Eindhoven, Muller uh, got the, I mean, the, performed the first uh, ECG, there were two waves only. When Eindhoven uh, performed initially with crude method, he called it A, B, C, D. But later on, when he corrected, he, he had to choose another letters. Then he remembered René Descartes, uh, who was an analytical geometry. He, Descartes used the P on the, uh, as a point in a point in a curve in successive, uh, I mean, curve. So he used the Descartes uh, points starting with PQ and went on. The advantage of this was that if in future any, any wave discovered before P, they had the letter, and if it was after T also they had, but in ABCD before A, they didn't have anything. I will explain here. Eindhoven chose the letter PQRST to separate tracing from the uncorrected curve label ABCD. The letters PQRST undoubtedly came from the system of the labeling used by Descartes to designate successive points on the curve. So this is why why is it called PT, PQRST. The first human ECG recorded by Waller in 1887 at Sans Marie Hospital, London, with Lipman's capillary electrometer. That time it revealed only two deflection and accordingly he labeled two waves as V1, V2, indicating ventricular events. The ECG recorded by Eindhoven with an even more refined Lipman capillary electrometer showed four deflection, which was ABCD. But since it was crudely corrected and made it PQRSC, now, <clears throat> the, the, please uh, note here that the clinical insolvents immobile, because that time the equipment was immobile, required trans-telephonic transmission of the ECG wave from physiology lab to the clinic and academic hospital a miles away. So please note, patient was in hospital, machine was in the laboratory and one mile it was connected by telephone wires, as documented in 196 paper of the Eindhoven telecardiogram, which he is called. This paper contained a wealth of ECG patterns and arrhythmias. Well, <clears throat> Eindhoven recognized the great potential importance of the ECG as a diagnostic and investigative tool, and his achievements made him the founder of modern electrocardiography. He was awarded Nobel Prize in 1924, just two years after the death of Waller, because Waller uh, did the first ECG in physiology and medicine for the discovery of the machine electrocardiogram. We must remember them. Well, this is the method how they made. This is the Waller. Actually, he did on his dog called Jimmy first time. And this is Wilson here. While uh, Eindhoven was receiving Nobel Prize, he praised the Thomas Lewis. Thomas Lewis, who was very famous, said, when an examination of heart is incomplete, if the new method is neglected, means this ECG. This is interesting, you know, this is how the ECG was done. The patient used to put right hand, left hand, and left foot in hypertonic salt solution as electrode. This was the initial electrode used. And now you see here, as I mentioned, patient was in uh, hospital, machine was in the lab, and one mile different. The instrument weighs 600 pounds and was operated by five individuals. Now you see uh, Dr. Suleiman and other cardiologists but with portable, they are doing the galvanometer housed in the physiology lab in Leiden was connected by telephone wire to the clinic at the academic hospital more than one mile. History is very interesting. And this is the close view of the patient and, and the lab one mile away. And this is the famous Eindhoven triangle. Well, this is a timeline of the ECG in brief. It started with Matthiosi. This is the Waller. 
First time, <coughs> recorded the first electrical activity in human. Eintomen first used the term EKG. Why it is called K in Germany? Cardiac is uh, spelled as K. Electrocardiography, that is why they use EKG. And it went over the Eintomen, trilid EKG, then um, Eintomen won the Nobel Prize, and Wilson made precordial uh, leads, and Goldberg made the augmented uh, unipolar leads. It's very interesting history. I'm not going to detail on that. Now, father and mother of pediatric cardiology, Helen Tosig and uh, Nadas. You see here on, uh, on his right is Abraham Rudolph. Abraham Rudolph has written a book, Rudolph's Pediatrics. Those who have read, he is also another pioneer in cardiology. Well, there were three major revol revolutionary innovations and paradigm shift in congenital heart diseases intervention over the last half century. What were these? The heart-lung machine, neonatal cardiac surgery, and transcatheter therapy. No, well, regarding the history, there were two parts, extracardiac and intercardiac. Regarding extracardiac, this is very interesting to note the first ligation of PDA by Dr. Robert Cross in 1938. Please note, he was just a resident. He did the PDA operation. Now, we were a resident, we used to stitch the skin and we were very happy. PDA, when he was the resident and he was fired by his uh, boss, lad, father of pediatric surgery, repair of coarctation of aorta by Crawford in 1944, and subclavian to pulmonary artery that famous balaloctastic shunt performed in 1944, and the first pulmonary artery banding by Dr. Muller in 1955. Of course, they, I'm not going to the detail intercardiac. Dr. Lewis performed the first intercardiac surgical procedure in 1952 when he repaired atrial septic defect. <clears throat> well, this is interesting to know. Heart disease in children found its place in the first time, for the first time in a book on pediatric written by Thomas Morgan Raj in 18. 96. This book had only seven pages devoted to congenital heart disease. Today in the conference, I was telling who is this Thomas Morgan Raj. Thomas Morgan Raj is the person who first used the term formula. He invented the term formula for uh, artificial supplementary milk. The, in fact, the first book, which was totally devoted to the congenital heart disease, was written by Dr. Tossing, the mother of pediatric cardiology and a comprehensive textbook of pediatric cardiology was first published by Alexander Nados in 1956, the father of pediatric cardiology. This is Dr. Nados and Dr. Abraham Rudolf and other cardiologists, very nice photo. And here, this is Dr. Helen Tossing and this is Thomas, and he is the president of the uh, John Hopkins. See, I would like to tell you this Thomas was assistant laboratory technician. He helped the Dr. Balalog in operations. See later on, a laboratory technician was given doctorate degree by the John Hopkins and he went on to train the future pediatric surgeons, cardiac surgeons who are the world famous. He, he was just a technician. <clears throat> just uh, remember pioneers, I'm not going to, this is the Dr. Gras first patient is a seven years girl who did the first PDA. And after 25 years, they met again. It, it came to the times and created a lot of noise. All three, this is the center, you see Thomas. And this is the <clears throat> Ellen Saxon, the first blue baby who underwent this shunt on November 28, 1904. Just to remember pioneers, and you see this is a famous operation. Dr. Tossing is doing this behind him, this uh, Wilson. Thomas, Thomas is there, who, be, uh, who got the doctorate degree. Now, this is the uh, statistic given before 1938, only, uh, I mean, 1930 to 1940, 50% chances of survival were there. So, and now you see this more than 90% in 2003, how much the cardiac surgery has helped these people. And this is by CDC. I'm not going to detail of that thing. 
About 95% of babies born with non-critical congenital heart disease are expected to survive to 18 years. And about 25% of the babies with congenital heart disease have critical defect. I'm not going to the detail of that. Just briefly, history of pediatric cardiology in India, because we have many uh, viewers from India. Dr. Padmavati and Dr. Ritilingam underwent training in pediatric cardiology at international centers in the early 50s and 60s. Dr. Gopinath successfully closed the ventricular septal, septal defect using pump oxygenometer as CMC below. And Dr. Rajinder Tandon, very famous pediatric cardiologist who wrote the cardiology chapter in OP guidebook. He trained for two years in Boston Children's Hospital under Dr. Nadas and then joined Al India Institute in 1963. Very famous pediatric cardiologist. There is a beautiful article by Dr. Anita Saxena, who is the, one of the best uh, pediatric cardiologists in Delhi. The first cardiothoracic surgery department was started in Velour. In 1930, Velour is in uh, Tamil Nadu, a state of India, Madras, near Madras. Ligation of PDA was first surgery for congenital heart disease. It was performed by Dr. Billy Moria. In, in Bombay in 1950s, and part chance was performed in 1951 by Betts at CMC Velo and Dr. Sen performed the first repair of coarctation of our in 1953. This is for our Indian colleagues. The first open heart surgery was atrial septal defect, which was performed with Dr. Dastur in Bombay in 1961. After spending two years at Toronto, with Dr. Kai, Dr. Sukumar established the pediatric cardiology at Belo in 70s. And in 1982, the first mitral valve ballon dilatation was performed in India. And Dr. Srivastava, who was a professor at All India New Delhi, created for uh, <clears throat> advancing the subspecialty of pediatric cardiac intervention in India. The other, Dr. Gopina sent a stroke tandem. Srivastava and Vitalingam and Padmavati, we must remember them also. Here you see, this is Dr. Saxena, this is the uh, 2014 uh, Asia Pacific Cardiac uh, Meeting. Our speaker, Dr. Uh, Debadatta, presented in this conference. And you see here, Dr. Saxena uh, in a WHO meeting. With, uh, this, this is a beautiful photo here. You see Dr. Kel Bahi the head of the department at All India with other colleagues. Well, pediatric cardiology in UAE, just I'll mention. Dr. Sharban Abdullah is the first doctor from the UAE to specialize in pediatric cardiology. Dr. Sharban was head of the children's section at al Wasal Hospital, now Latifa Hospital, and chairman of the Pediatric Society UAE. She was also chairperson of the Dubai Health Authority Standing Child Protection Committee. Now, another famous member, Dr. Abdullah Al Hayat, consultant pediatrician, pediatric cardiologist, one of the most prestigious and active pediatrician in UAE. He started his career in 1970, soon after finishing basic medicine study. In the year 1993, he became the consultant pediatrician and stay attached with Rashid Hospital, Dubai Hospital, Al Wasal Hospital as consultant and in charge of the pediatric department. We must remember seniors. And in year 2001, he was given the responsibility to lead the Al-Wasal Hospital as a director. Now here you see they are uh, felicitated by His Excellency, Sheikh Dr. Majid bin Said Al-Numeri in Ajman. You see here, uh, Dr. Khaya, Dr. Sharman, Dr. Mustafa, we also have seen here. Other senior doctors also they have seen. Now, our speaker and panelists, I have sent their profiles. Briefly, I'm going to introduce them. Dr. Depadata Mukhopadhyay, Associate Professor of Pediatrics in West Bengal University of Medical Sciences and a visiting consultant pediatric cardiologist at Apollo Hospital, Kolkata, India. Dr. Mahmoud Asufi, Dr. Mahmoud Asufi is kind enough to join us from abroad. He is not in the UAE. He is a consultant pediatric cardiologist at Al Jalila Children's Hospital, Dubai, UAE. Dr. Muhammad Suleiman, kind enough to join us from Egypt. 
He's a consultant pediatric cardiologist at Kids Heart Center, Dubai, very well known in Dubai. Dr. Samir Sajwani, senior consultant pediatric cardiologist, well known. He is in many, attached to many hospitals. At present, Dr. Suleiman and Habib Medical Center, Dubai. And we have with us Dr. Muhammad Rashid, IUB, consultant cardiovascular surgeon and pediatric cardiac surgeon, attached to Bibi Bodar and Amway hospitals in Calcutta. He has done 5,000 uh, pediatric cardiac operations. Well, my reference is beautiful Dubai. I would like to welcome all to come and visit Dubai. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to request Dr. Debadetta, Senior Consultant Pediatric Cardiologist from Calcutta, India, to join us and start a presentation. Dr. Debadetta is going to give us, show us the interesting cases in pediatric cardiology. After that, we will have a panel with experts. Over to Dr. Debadetta, please. Uh, a very good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saurabh, for uh, inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Saurabh, Dr. Kalpana, everybody at the Dubai Pediatric Club, my co-panelists, and also the audience for uh, staying up so late and listening to my talk. And uh, Dr. Saurabh, it was a wonderful uh, um, listening to you, actually. I didn't know many of the things which you told. <laughs> it was like discovering my own country again, once again. Thank you for the lovely presentation. Uh, so uh, shall I uh, share the screen? Please, please. Yeah. Yeah, please. Good please evening please. and thank you for having me here. Uh, this is a very, very vast topic. And uh, I think there have been many textbooks written on this. So what I'll do is I'll run you through some of the very interesting cases which I came across. And uh, we'll just discuss some important pointers as we discuss the cases. So uh, whenever... Uh, it comes to congenital heart diseases, I always feel I am one of those six blind men who is trying to decipher what the elephant is. All of us have our own perspectives and we always look at the things from our own perspectives. So coming to statistics, it is the most frequently occurring congenital disorder occurring for about one third of all the congenital birth defects. The birth prevalence is around 8 to 12 per thousand love live births, and it is pretty constant uh, worldwide. The estimated burden of the disease is about 2 lakhs, incidence of the disease is about 2 lakhs per year, and uh, it accounts for about 40,000 of complex and very severe defects, which necessitate surgical intervention early in infancy. Approximately 10% of the mortality in infants may be accounted for by the congenital heart diseases. But if we can do a fairly good screening and early diagnosis and treatment, then overall the survival is almost 90%. So that gives us a lot of hope. And uh, conventionally, this is the uh, broad classifications under which we uh, put congenital heart diseases. The Acyanotic heart diseases, which uh, are actually left to right shunts like ASD, BSD, PD, AP windows. Cyanotic heart diseases, with where there is, uh, you know, decreased, uh, like there may be decreased or increased pulmonary blood flow, such as TOC or PGA with BSD, la large BSD, respectively. The concept of cyanotic and acyanotic heart disease nowadays, nowadays are actually. Uh, they are actually a misnomer because there may be many complex diseases which um, may present with totally increased blood, pulmonary blood flow and may not have complex, may not have cyanosis at all. So, but still conventionally, this is what it is. There may be obstructive lesions like the coaptation, aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, single ventricle complexes, which may be well part of the heterotaxias and also a huge spectrum of uh, the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. 
and tricuspid atrexia, of course. And there may be other diseases also like cardiomyopathy, especially the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathies, which may be part of syndromes. It may be part of metabolic diseases as well. Also, coronary abnormalities also can form a good chunk of those miscellaneous disorders. Valvular lesions of congenital uh, stenotic or uh, regurgitant uh, abnormal valves, dysplastic valves, form a huge uh, percentage but I will mainly concentrate on the first uh, few. So this very beautiful article uh, came out, written by Dr. Krishna Kumar and his team in uh, February uh, 21st, I think February 21 issue of the Child India. And here, the broad categories of congenital heart disease is based or is classified based on the severity. Firstly, it is a critical congenital heart disease which needs uh, a specific intervention within the first few days or first few months of life. Otherwise, it will be incompatible with survival. And that is like TGA, PAPVC. There may be major congenital heart diseases where an intervention is required, but often in infancy for a good long-term outcome. For example, tetralogies, large BSD and PDAs, and of course, Alcapa. There may be CHDs which manifest typically at older age group and a diagnosis is made around childhood and they have a fair possibility of surviving up to adulthood as well. And this, this may be ASD, some of the milder forms of coarctation and less severe forms of valvular stenosis. Minor CHDs like a small VSD, ASD, or PDA, or a bicuspid aortic valve with little stenosis may have, have a good long-term or symptom-free survival without interventions. And all our interventions are based on this holy grail, this article which has been written by the drawings of uh, Indian pediatric cardiology. It, uh, this consensus sort of gives us a very uh, well formulated and excellent guideline uh, which we can follow for proper treatment of the children. And it came out in uh, 15th of February 2020 issue of the Indian Pediatrics. I can share the link also with the group. So coming to the cases, this is a two day old boy presenting uh, with tachypnea, very dusky, Boy was uh, had an uneventful pregnancy, born at term by normal vaginal delivery, was okay till the first few first two days, but then started having subcostal and intercostal recessions and developed very severe cyanosis. Uh, CRT was prolonged. There was a lot of tachycardia. The child was transferred to the NICU where his perfusions became further uh, reduced. And despite giving oxygen, the saturations were consistently below 80%. Now, what may be the possible causes? One may be early onset sepsis, and uh, it could also be in various respiratory causes, surgical causes like diaphragmatic hernia and all. It could be metabolic derangements as well. Uh, but an important pointer is that initially uh, the child was okay, but then the child became worsened quite. Uh, you know, over a very short span of time, and that indicates a possibility of a drug dependent patient. So this was the X-ray. As you can see, the it seems to be a little plethoric lung fields, and this X-ray is typical of the egg on side appearance that we have in cases of transposition. Are my uh, videos visible? Doctor. Yes. Yes, they are visible. Okay. If you can see the videos from this is the left ventricle. This is the echo of uh, showing the left ventricle, and the vessel that is coming out from the left ventricle is divided into two branches. And this is a case of transposition. And we did find that this interventricular septum was intact. So that led to the child crashing after the duct closed. And the, here we find the short axis view showing the anterior posterior disposition of the great vessels, the posterior one being the pulmonary artery dividing into two. And uh, the child also had a very restricted atrial interatrial communication or PFO. As we know, in cases of intact uh, interventricular septum, in cases of TGA, the main mixing is at the level of the interatrial septum. 
So a few words, it is rarely associated with chromosomal anomalies, may be associated with dextrocardia and isomerism. Maternal diabetes is an important association. Two important uh, factors which will decide the subsequent treatment is presence of a VSD and presence of a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. That is pulmonary stenosis, which may be at various levels, subvalvular, valvular, or supravalvular. But sometimes there may be coronary anomalies as well. There are various coronary anomalies which are associated. They may be with the TGA. Usually surgeons all over the world, they are quite, they have become quite competent at managing these uh, TGAs with coronary anomalies. But sometimes a single coronary artery and all, or maybe an undetected coronary course may be an issue during the surgery. So presentation in the newborn will depend again on the VSD and the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. If it is a large VSD, it may be or asymptomatic and present late with heart failure. Severe left ventricular outflow tract obstruction may present with profound cyanosis. Intact interventricular septum will present like a duct dependent patient once the duct closes. That is, the child will crash with tachypnea and cyanosis and shock. So, in emergency conditions, we do a balloon atrial septectomy. Here is a, a procedure that describes the diagram describing the procedure. The balloon is uh, put in through the right atrium and then to the left atrium it is inflated in the left atrium with a sharp tug it is pulled into the right atrium and this is the position of the balloon as you can see in the left atrium and then after tearing the septum a bit it has come into the right atrium so this creates a good communication between the two atria and there is good uh, flow good mixing at the atrial level which actually is essential for survival. This can be done as a bedside procedure in many places. And sometimes the child may be uh, taken to the cat lab as well. But all said and done, though we may start prostaglandin to keep the duct open so that there is increased left atrial pressure, increased left ventricular pressure, and that leads to increased left to right shunt at the atrial level again. Despite that, despite giving doing the balloon atrial septectomy which helps us maybe to buy time but the main of the main treatment would be surgery and that is preferably an atri uh, arterial switch operation or aso some of the points to ponder though the intensivists they love the uh, though the intensivists love the prostaglandins and they are happy with the prostaglandins some, most of the times we are also happy that the child is doing okay, child is stable. But some of the important things that have come up in recent research is that prostaglandins will cause opening of the duct, which will cause a diastolic steel in the PDA. And that might lead to decreased cerebral blood flow, NEC, and other side effects also. Prostaglandin has other side effects like apnea, fever, hypotension, and uh, also balloon atrial septectomy may lead to some uh, reported side effects like neurological issues, vascular trauma, arrhythmias, etc. Now, also research shows that the number of days on ventilation and ICU stray will have an effect on the IQ. One interesting thing that has come up is the neurodevelopmental issues in transposition and also in cases of some diseases like hypoplastic left heart where the left ventricular outflow tract uh, outflow tract obstructions are there and they have shown that overall there is decrease in brain volume of these children and I'll discuss later on these children develop various neurodevelopmental uh, problems later on also in their life. So this is the it, arterial switch operation where the uh, like the great arteries are transposed and by the Lecompte man maneuver the pulmonary artery is brought in front the usual issues may be bleeds, a lot of coronary issues in the immediately post of period and arrhythmias. So these are the coronaries, usual arrangement of the coronaries in TTA. Post-operatively, we have to be aware of the regurgitation, possible coronary stenosis, the function also. Uh, in India, because some children come un undetected from rural areas also sometimes, we find children coming much later and where the left ventricle, which has been exposed to the pulmonary um, 
artery or the pulmonary vascular resistance for a long time uh, actually sort of regressed is become smaller the mass decreases and the lv becomes smaller so in those cases if we do an arterial switch operation on them they will not be able to sustain the high systemic pressure so this, this is how we assess the um, left ventricle for preparedness preparedness for arterial switch operation and you know the typical this is the in the short axis view a banana shaped lv will indicate that probably this arterial switch is not a good option for them and these are the factors indication for retraining the lv by a band or maybe going for a seni so this is the seni operation where uh, we can uh, just see that a baffle is created between the left atrium uh, between the systemic ventricles to the left atrium and the pulmonary veins to the right atrium thus redirecting the blood flow but at the end of the day since the rv is the systemic ventricle rv dysfunction is common and tricuspid regurgitation is one of the comorbidities also arrhythmias are very common uh, in this uh, post operatively here in one of our cases we see that um, there is obstruction at the pulmonary this is the pulmonary baffle and this flow turbulence over here indicates a uh, obstruction at the pulmonary baffle and it has got a high gradient and it also leads to a lot of pulmonary regurgitation so coming again to duct dependent lesions these are the duct dependent pulmonary lesions such as pulmonary atresia very Uh, critical pulmonary stenosis in fallows or with very narrow branch pulmonary arteries tricuspid atresia with very small branch pulmonary arteries critical ts etc and duct dependent systemic uh, lesions like hypoplastic left heart critical coarct interrupted aortic heart etc so in either way we see that it is a duct which is playing the major role in maintaining the circulation whether it is a pulmonary circulation or the systemic circulation the duct plays the major role so this is a picture of ductal stenting which uh, done by my interventional colleague dr nurul and where i assisted him and also assisted by our very competent assistant dr mr devashish so uh, this is the uh, duct after addition uh, of the stent and uh, this is the ductal stenting stent in c2 and uh, the child was doing well it was a case of tricuspid atresia pulmonary atresia and post ductal stent the child was relieved of the severe cyanotic spells so uh, <clears throat> these are the causes of uh, low cardiac output state in newborns all of them present with low cardiac output state but their uh, anatomies and uh, are very very different for example uh this is a child with oligemic lung fields more or less uh, uh not much cardiomegaly this child had crashed on uh, at 36 hours not improving with oxygen and this was a case of duct dependent pulmonary circulation and pulmonary atresia in the middle is again a case of uh, tga who had crashed at uh, with around 48 hours of age and this was tga with intact septum and a restrictive pfo on my right is a newborn presenting with shock at 8 hours severe metabolic acidosis and hepatomegaly and this was a case of obstructed tapvc intracardiac type this is a very close this ground glass appearance is a very close differential of the looks just like those hyaline membrane disease x rays so this is all about newborn presence with shock and cyanosis and this was a 6 day old newborn presenting with respiratory distress cyanosis severe met metabolic acidosis large liver and no murmur so this is again a ground glass appearance and these are the various forms of tapvc we have cardiac where it goes to the coronary sinus supracardiac from the uh, vertical vein going to the innominate and then to the svc and intracardiac where all the veins join into a confluence and draining into the Uh, biliary hepatic radicals and then ivc and uh, this is the mix and there may be also a very complicated mix type which is a nightmare for the surgeon so our case was a case of intracardiac type of 
TAPVC. As you can see here, there is a uh, none of the pulmonary veins are opening into the left atrium, and there is a vertical um, the vein which is going down, down right up to the biliary radicals and going into the liver. And here the blue flow is the uh, stretched PFO going totally right to left. Here the blue flow, the PFO going right to left. This is again two parallel vessels coming down. This is the aorta over here and this big one which is collapsing a little bit respiration. This one is the uh, in the vertical vein of the pulmonary uh, of the PAPVC which is going down. And here it is dividing to various small minute radicals. So this will always be obstructed and uh, cause a lot of uh, distress and as well as pulmonary drift power to the child. This was another day three old baby boy, 3.4 kilos with mild tachypnea pers persisting after feeds with a saturation of 96% in air. The um, the doctor had, the pediatrician had referred to me because of a very faint murmur that she heard. And this is what I found. There's this small uh, kind of a uh, chamber over here. And I can see some flow turbulence over here. And this is a, another chamber is lying just behind the left atrium. And it is not, uh, none of the pulmonary veins I can see draining into the left atrium directly. So this was in case of obstructed coronary type sinus type of TAPVC. You can see the coronary sinus over here coming down. And the confluence of the coronary sinus with the confluence of the main chamber formed by the confluence of pulmonary veins was actually very narrow and obstructed. So this, this is a case of a usual unobstructed coronary sinus TAPVC where we can see a nice fish tail appearance. See? So just like a whale's tail appearance, no obstruction. The child had presented with features of tachypnea, a little bit of failure. But in this child, it was uh, really obstructed and uh, it, was, it had to be operated, but sadly the child didn't survive. So just to complete the entire series, this was a two-year-old, uh, sorry, a one-year-old child who had come with a failure to thrive, cardiomegaly, very irritable child, a um, lot of growth retardation, a saturation of about 95%. And there is a, this is the ASD, which is shunting totally right to left over here. And huge dilated uh, right atrium right ventricle and a little bit of regurgitation also within the right, in the tricuspid band. So this is a very much dilated uh, veins. This is the vertical vein, which is huge and dilated, going up to the innominate and then into the SVC. So this, there is a lot of swirling of blood inside that huge dilated vein. So this was a case of supracardiac TAPVC. And uh, this is a typical egg on, sorry, this is a typical uh, figure of eight appearance, which we see in all the children in cases of supracardiac PAPVC. The left border formed by the vertical vein and the right border formed by the uh, dilated SVC. So this was about the newborn presenting with heart failure. Another newborn had presented with heart failure, poor feeding, tachycardia, tachypnea, suboptimal weight gain, had cardiomegaly and wet lungs. This child had been dis discharged with the diagnosis of two very small 2.4 mm perimembranous VSD left to right with a rest restrictive flow with, and a small PDA also mainly with a systolic flow. And at that time at discharge around 40 to 72 hours, the child was quite stable. And uh, subsequently, this boy presented with this huge cardiomegaly and wet lungs the flow in the VSD was here like this. And uh, we also found that the PDA was having very low velocity diastolic blood flow and uh, the child definitely was having feature of failure. So probably it was a case of uh, both the shunts contributing and leading to the failure once the pulmonary pressures had come down. So if the it was the, uh, not controlled with diuretics or AC inhibitors. The child remained tachypnic, had really very uh, problems in feeding and subsequently had to be operated right away. 
So hemodynamically significant PDA, which would mandate a closure, will be a PDA which is having left atrial or left ventricle enlargement in echo, an end diastolic flow velocity very low in LPA, and a diastolic flow reversal in the abdominal aorta. Clinically, the child may have mild cardiac enlargement. There may be a mid diastolic murmur in the uh, mitral area, and also the murmur may not be that. Uh, prominent also. It may be just a systolic murmur, not a continuous murmur. And uh, options uh, would be definitely diuretics, fluid restrictions. Brufen was used, but nowadays we have been getting a lot of good results with paracetamol and uh, for giving in the usual dose of 50 milligram per kg IV or oral in four divide, uh, four, for four times a day for five days, and it's been giving very good results. In terms, in preterms, in terms, usually the um, option is a ductal dilation or a, a device closure, and these are the indications again of device closure or uh, going for a surgery in cases of uh, PD. So, in uh, just a pointer, in cases of severe birth asphyxia or PPHN, there may be a very patent duct, and the flow may be entirely right to left. And at that time, we usually don't want to close the duct because it acts as a pop-off for the very high PA pressures. Silent PDA is not an indication for closure. And usually a PDA that persists beyond three months, that is considered as a congenital and RBP. So coming to the asymptomatic newborn, uh, which actually gave us goosebumps, it was a two-week-old baby, doesn't 3.3 kilos, presenting with uh, good saturations. Referral again for a very soft systolic murmur, which I barely heard. Baby was tolerating feeds and had normal examination of the newborn at discharge at 48 hours. So on examination, I found, oh sorry, on echo, I found there was this uh, very narrow, like around 1.8 to 2 millimeters narrowing at the isthmus and this ductal, this posterior shelf in the duct. So it was a case of severe coaptation associated with the bicuspid aortic valve and there was a good gradient across the um, descending aorta. The child was operated. Uh, this child was operated in another institution and by choice it was of the surgeon, it was an end to end anastomosis. And uh, maybe it was just a personal operative choice which he thought it was important. But uh, usually in newborns, they may also do a left subclavian repair. And after three months, this child had come with uh, another, when the child came for follow-up, this was, there was severe co re-coaptation. So uh, I think uh, it is important to say that like, co-optation will always require a lifelong follow-up. A large PDA will be difficult to comment on co co-optation and palpable femorals will not rule out a co-optation because the duct may be present. And in older children, especially if there is an aberrant uh, artery below, arising from below the subclavian, there may be, and presence of lots of collaterals also, there may be a good uh, palpable, palpable femorals. So evaluation of the arch anatomy, aberrant vessels, the entire le left ventricular outflow tract size of the left and of course Doppler of the uh, abdominal aorta and evaluation of the aortic valve is very important in cases of coaptation and also to rule out associated anomalies. Uh, this is, these are the types of interrupted aortic arch and important is that uh, type B, which is most common, present in almost more than half of, of the, all the cases, in 50% of the cases is associated with b George syndrome that is 22 to 11 deletion. Am I audible just to break the monotony? Hello? Hello? Excellent, excellent, Dr. Devadatta. Continue, thank, please. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, this was a, another case uh, of a six month old presenting with chesty cuff and a lot of wheeze. He had uh, the history of recurrent respiratory tract infection and a suboptimal weight gain. On examination, had intercostal and subcostal refractions like any other children presenting with bronchiolitis. 
and tachycardia tachypnea 96%. What was uh, important is that the child had a very prominent P2 and a hyperdynamic precordium. This was a case of a large VSD with severe PAH. And uh, if we do ECG in these cases, we can find prominent biventricular forces like you know R and S waves, R waves in V1 and S R waves in V5 also. They are uh, like there is both right and left ventricular predominance. So this indicates that it is both ventricles are very uh, dominating and it's a large uh, VSD. So this was the case with a very large VSD over here and dilated all cardiac chambers and severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this was another case, just exactly like the previous case. Clinically, we couldn't understand any difference between the two cases, excepting when we did the echo. This was a case of uh, common AV valve defect. You can see this is a common AV valve. There are no separate uh, tricuspid or mitral valves. There is a primum ASD, sorry, a partial AVSD, and uh, sorry, um, or primum ASD as well as a, um, a large inlet VSD. So uh, these are the actually this later on we found this child had heterotaxia as well, and was part of the isomerism complex. And these AVSDs are common in trisomy, especially in trisomy 21, 40 to 50 percent cases may be associated with AVSD, atrial ventricular septal defect. And actually, it, atrial ventricular septal defect may be partial with only the primum ASD or no VSD. It may be also transitional with a small VSD and it may, may occur a complete balanced one with two good side ventricles. It may be an unbalanced one with one ventricle dominating. And that becomes a nightmare again for the cardiologist as well as the surgeon to decide which pathway the child will go for. AV valvular regurgitation is an important factor to decide the uh, preoperative as well as the postoperative course. It is often associated with uh, heterotaxias and isomerism. So coming to our uh, little uh, less complex lesion, that is the VSD. In when we get a case of VSD, we go for the geography, that is exactly the location of it, the borders, the size, the number, and any associated malformations. Because an apparently um, very innocent looking perimembranous uh, VSD may have a valvular override or a malalignment or even a straddling also. So these are the various positions uh, from the RV side. This is the tricuspid valve. And just behind the tricuspid valve, this may be a perimembranous defect or a perimembranous with an inlet defect. Just below the aortic valve, it may be a subaortic or outlet VSD. Below the pulmonary valve, it may be a muscular VSD or it could be apical muscular VSD also. And it is very important to see, uh, I think for the surgeon, uh, they will agree that it's important to note uh, which part the bundle of his will fo is following according to the VSD. For example, in this case, it is here, but in cases of a large inlet uh, VSD, it is usually in the posterior inferior rim, as you can see from, um, yeah. yeah, this is the outlet VSD. Yeah, over here, the large inlet VSD will have in the posterior inferior rim. And so if it is very close and the bites are taken very nearby, it will lead to complete heart block. So this is again a large inlet VSD and this child uh, had a PA band done for the large VSD. Outlet VSD that is just below the aortic valve over here may lead to aortic valve prolapse and subsequent aortic regurgitation. Anything more than a trivial aortic regurgitation mandates a closure of the VSD as well as repair of the valve. And it is by the uh, huge jet of blood flow or the venturi effect by which the valve is actually sucked into the tiny VSD foramen. So this is what I was trying to show you that this is the membranous conduction axis and this is the inlet with ventricular defect. So it's very important to be careful and uh, it's, uh, it's a surgeon's uh, discretion 
where to take the sutures during uh, operation of this kind of defects because they are very close to the conduction bundle and may lead to complete heart block. So again, our uh, recommendations are our uh, holy grail to follow in treatment. A large VSD with poor growth of congestive cardiac failure not controlled with medications should be operated as soon as possible. If controlled heart failure, then by six months in order to prevent the pulmonary vascular resistance to go to irreversible stage. We usually, um, there may be a reversibility study by catheterization where we determine the QPQS, that is the pulmonary and the systemic blood flow, and also the pulmonary as well as systemic vascular resistance. So contraindications will be definitely irreversible pulmonary vascular disease, which we can confirm by a catheterization. And uh, device closures are also possible if there is good rims. And it is an entire device closure is entire another presentation. So I will not go into that. Coming to cyanotic heart diseases, again, it can be divided as told, as I told before, it may be an increased pulmonary blood flow or decreased pulmonary blood flow. Increased pulmonary blood flow may be TGA with intact septum, VORV with a large VSD, truncus or a single ventricle without any pulmonary stenosis. Decreased pulmonary vascularity is the tetralogy of fallows with the um, or a double outlet right ventricle VSDPS, single ventricle with pulmonary stenosis, Epstein's anomaly or tricuspid atresia, where we have effective less pulmonary blood flow. And these are the fallows physiology complex. So this is what we can find uh, sorry, this is what we can find with uh, in the history. That is, the fallows physiology complex will give rise to cyanotic spells, history of squatting, very deep cyanosis. On examination, we can find a prominent or single P2 um, RVOT. Maybe there may be an ejection systolic murmur, but usually there is no cardiomegaly. There may not be any murmur also. Chest X-ray will have oligemic lung fields and no cardiomegaly. But when there is increased pulmonary blood flow, they will present just like a large VSD with interrupted feeds, suck rest, suck cycle, failure to thrive, repeated LRPIs, variable cyanosis, loud P2, or hyperdynamic precordium, and of course, cardiomegaly and plethoric lung fields. So this is basically age of onset of cyanosis. And clinical feed, this is from Park's textbook. But we have found variations in, of, of this in our clinical practice. But usually cyanotic heart disease may present also with clubbing, polycythemia, and of course, spells and CNS complications. This girl, you can appreciate, this girl had presented to the OPD with cyanosis and clubbing as to a single typical tetralogy of fallows operated with a, they had a very narrow, again, tetralogy of fallows, the operation will depend on the pulmonary annulus as well as the branch PA sizes. So uh, the pulmonary annulus was below 2 Z4, so it was uh, operated with a transpulmonary annuloplasty. This is the right axis deviation, lead one negative, AVF positive in the ECG. And there is an early transition of the R waves in V3. We can see this. And this is a typical boot-shaped heart with oligomic lung fields, a typical chest X-ray. Features of spell, bit, uh, in, if, if it presents suddenly, it may be a bit difficult to uh, see, but saturations are important to monitor. Less than two years with an incessant crying, with very deep cyanosis, tachypnea and a weird pattern of breathing, very deep, rapid breaths. Usually that is the presentation in the spells. And if it is not controlled, it may lead to anoxic seizures and the child may land in the ventilator also. And of course, we have to keep a knee chest position, give oxygen, sedate the child, like giving morphine and give uh, beta blockers. Propanolol, uh, we don't use. We usually use metoprolol, which works very well. Sometimes we might need phenylephrine also in refractory uh, cells. And ultimately, it is uh, we have, might need to ventilate and then go for a surgical uh, emergency BT shunt or uh, ductal stenting, whatever. And uh, 
important is that after each episode of cyst spell a neurological examination is very important and if we find any abnormalities then we need to go for ct or mri parents need to be explained the circumstances of the spell to avoid dehydration and rapid control of temperature whenever there is a fever and uh, also a surgical repair in these cases and dehydration and uh, anything which leads to decreased systemic vascular resistance that will lead to increased right to left blood flow and that will actually cause less pulmonary blood flow and hence increased hypoxia hypocapnia and then precipitate the spells and also occur in the vicious cycle so this is the uh, rv angiogram uh, usually a comprehensive uh, echo would be sufficient but sometimes when the branch pulmonary arteries are not that clear we may need to uh, do the rv angio to delineate the, the branch pulmonary arteries here there it is to be a little constriction over here and we have found that uh, these two indices are very good at uh, determining whether it will be good for a biventricular repair or not so uh, like we have to decide between bt shunt or a definite repair uh, bt shunt is uh, for whenever there is a very small hypoplastic branch phase or there is a coronary crossing the rvot it is a shunt put between the right subclavian and the pulmonary artery it has a host of perioperative issues which are a nightmare to the intensivist leading to high pulmonary blood flow obstruction leading to less pulmonary blood flow so nowadays many uh, in cases of single ventricle complexes many centers especially centers abroad they like to do uh, sano shunt or a bilateral pa banding so which i'll discuss later in relation to single ventricle complexes so this is the corrective repair for tetralogies uh, preserving the pulmonary annulus uh, if we have a if it is more than 2 these holes again discretion of the surgeon and uh, again uh, doing a trans pulmonary putting in a trans annular patch and this will lead to subsequent severe pulmonary regurgitation and that may lead to again uh, subsequent might need a pulmonary valve replacement and other complications like right ventricular uh, dilatation and sudden cardiac death and left car low car in the immediate post operative period low cardiac output state and rv dysfunction and arrhythmias are very very um, like detrimental to the post op tetralogy uh, repairs but uh, the, our center was very uh, like in, we used to while working with dr rashid we had uh, made a dictum to sort of take the child in out of the ventilator within 24 hours and it has worked really really well with us so in this child had again come at 15 years with significant effort intolerance cardiomegaly and a parasternal heave and grade 4 by 6 diastolic murmur in the left sternal edge actually had developed massive pulmonary regurgitation with a trans annular patch subsequently needed a tissue pulmonary valve but however all said and done no matter how much we read books and all patients don't come reading the book and sometimes the surprises are really not good surprises at all uh, sometimes they are good surprises but sometimes they are really very scary surprises so this is a 33 year old man who came to the opd with history of episodes of dizziness lasting few minutes at rest and on exertion over the last two weeks so he had almost stage 3 and like ha effort intolerance he had episodes of syncope quite a couple of times over the last two weeks and uh, occurred uh, lasted each time it lasted for a few seconds and otherwise he had been well all through these last three decades he had been a good swimmer he was a father of two healthy children and this was a patient who had bradycardia with a irregular heart rate 56 saturation for 95 to 96% so this was the chest x ray and this was the ecg the ecg has is showing complete heart block as you can see in long lead to this is a complete heart block with a very low around 50 or even lesser um, heart rate atrial rate and uh, sorry it was the ventricular rate is very low 
and uh, the atria are beating independent of the atria and the ventricles are beating independent of each other overall the ventricular rate is very very low around 40 or even less and this is the fault part of the uh, fault recording and um, again showing complete heart block my adult colleague this is the Come again, the halter report showing basic rhythm was AV dissociation, complete heart block with an average heart rate of 38. And ventricular ectopic beats sometimes were occurring. And uh, so this was the uh, coactivity showing it's a case of actually CCTGA or corrected, um, corrected transposition, where in the left side it is a tricuspid valve leading to the um, right ventricle. And on the right side, it is the mitral valve leading to the right-sided left ventricle. This left-sided right ventricle was actually giving rise to the aorta. And the pulmonary artery was actually arising from the right-sided left ventricle. So this was a corrected transposition. And uh, sorry and had a lot of, um, didn't have much of a regurgitation. A little bit of uh, regurgitation was there, not much. And the patient also had a few apical muscular VSDs. So this is post the pacemaker implantation. The child was taken over by the adult colleague and did quite well. Post, of, post pacemaker implantation, the function had improved a lot and the patient is on follow-up. So the complex uh, heart diseases like this uh, congenitally corrected transposition may have common associations like BSD, left ventricular outflow tract obstructions, tricuspid regurgitation because it may be a left-sided epstenoid valve association with right ventricular failure because ultimately the systemic ventricle, if the right ventricle is a systemic ventricle, it will fail. And of course, complete heart block is an is one of the almost 50% of cases will develop complete heart block later on in life. So these are the various methods of operation we can do. We can do a double switch or it's very complicated. So I'm not discussing it in details, but uh, it may be a double switch. It may be with a conduit in cases of pulmonary stenosis, or it can be with a rest and E plus sending plus conduit and various uh, decision making. So this is basically the decision making chart. So uh, let's uh, just ponder over what we went through all this while is that whenever we suspect a case of congenital heart disease, we have to uh, remind ourselves these things that, is there any cyanosis? Is there any heart failure? Is there any uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension? Or are there features of increased pulmonary blood flow? What is the rhythm? And of course, uh, in ECHO, we always follow the sequential segmental analysis. That is, we are looking at the situs, we are looking at the atrial and ventricular concordance and the ventricular and atrial uh, concordance of the AV concordance. So um, whether there is a left ventricle or a right ventricle dominant circulation and so on. So coming to the almost the last part of my discussions, I kept the complex diseases at the end. This is beyond uh, this little presentation also, but this like it's very important because uh, a lot of work is being done on these uh, complex heart diseases worldwide. Uh, tricuspid atria, this is tricuspid atresia where you can find a small RV. And this is hypoplastic left heart where it is a small LV. In addition to that, there may be proper single ventricles. You can have a double inlet left ventricle itself. That can be a proper uh, single ventricle, uh, univentricular heart, what we call it. And those ventricles, they, it is important to find the actual anatomy, especially the branch pulmonary arteries, the lung, the PA pressures, which can be found out by um, the special CAT techniques. And of course, the ventricular function is important as well as the AV regurgitations. These factors will decide on the subsequent operability or whether what kind of operation the patients will have. Usually in our armamentorium, we have these kind of, uh, all these um, options. We can have a BT shunt, uh, which is part of the Norwood procedure for the hypoplastic left heart, where we have a, like the, I describe a small conduit between the right 
uh, subclavian and the right pulmonary artery and also uh, arch reconstruction. So that may be a part of the first stage of Norwood, of first stage operation of Norwood in cases of hypoplastic left heart. Many centers uh, opt for a Sano because they don't want a BT shunt. They will put in a long uh, conduit between the RV to the pulmonary artery, and it is also gives good results along with the reconstruction of the arch. Bilateral PA banding in some cases where there is a lot of um, high pulmonary blood flow, where there is no pulmonary stenosis, rather there is pulmonary overflow. So till they are going for a Glen, they may go for a bilateral PA banding. There have been centers abroad like USA where they have found good results with bilateral PA banding. And uh, also at the end, we will need a Glen or a, and subsequently a Fontan. Glen would be like a uh, the superior vena cava connected to the pulmonary artery. So that would bypass the right heart as a whole. And subsequently, sorry, subsequently, the inferior vena cava will be connected to the pulmonary artery. So the entire right heart will be uh, completely um, sort of bypassed and they are entirely going to the, so the systemic venous circulation is entirely going to the pulmonary um, circulation. So it is a, like a circulation in series. So uh, these operations deserve a complete symposium on their own because they have their own uh, preoperative and perioperative issues. So let's, we can discuss it in subsequently in the panel discussions also. Uh, my last case is another uh, baby, two-year-old child actually, failure, presenting with failure to thrive, pale, very unsettled, were having poor volume pulses. Apex was displaced in about six intercostal space. Actually, I couldn't, about two centimeters from the midline and it was very diffuse kind of an apex. There was no murmur and the child was very, very irritable, not allowing examination at all. So this was the X-ray showing huge cardiomegaly. As, as expected, uh, this echo showed severe LV dysfunction. As you can see, this huge LV with almost global dyskinesia, and there was moderate MR. And uh, here, the papillary muscles are also echoic. And what clinches the diagnosis is uh, perhaps the ECG, where we find a very uh, deep Q waves in lead one and lead AVL. To be very honest with you, the child was so unsettled, we could only do this much. He actually took away the chest leads. So in lead one and lead AVL, we can see very deep Q waves. And this is another uh, from another child with Alcapa, just to demonstrate the very deep Q waves in lead one, AVL, V5 and V6, which are left-sided leads. So this is a case of Alcapa, and we can find the, the coronary artery arising from the pulmonary artery over here. You can see this, the two branches of the coronaries arising and the main coronary arising from the pulmonary artery. This is the aorta over here, and this is the pulmonary artery, which is divided into two branches, and the coronary is arising from here. So this is Alcapa. And these are the surgical options. You can, the coronary button transfer is now preferred. And uh, previously many did Takeuchi procedure where the baffle was created between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So just to, just as a recapitulation, while we concentrate on the heart, we should not forget the brain and also the growth of the child the dysmorphism, the features of soft features of dysmorphism that can come up, polyductile, limb and thoracic and other deformities, and of course the other systems. Because we may not may be looking at an entire um, uh, kind of a, not only syndromic child, but we do have to, we have the responsibility of giving the holistic care to the child. So on my left, the two pictures of a tall uh, girl, about 14 years coming with Marfan syndrome, with these kind of thumb sign and this wrist sign. 
for whom Dr. Rashid had operated a couple of days before because of severe valvular regurgitation. On my uh, right is a child who had just this kind of a uh, hand uh, deformity. This thumb is just attached by a rudimentary uh, kind of a um, connection to the uh, left hand. So this prompted the resident to ask for an echo. And I must thank the resident because this child had a very complex heart disease with isomerism. So uh, this child had a kind of pulmonary atresia, then uh, right kind of a heterotaxia, aorta arising from the RV and pulmonary atresia, duct dependent circulation. So it was very, very nasty kind of condition. And uh, child was immediately taken up for further management. So this is uh, basically a bird's eye view of what I have tried to give you through the entire hour or so. I think I've been talking alone. So just to end it all, fetal echo. I am actually uh, actively doing fetal echo also. So it is usually done at 16 to 24 weeks, maybe done later also, but that is the ideal time. And in various, these are the various views we see. And needless to say, that in those views, we can find out almost, almost all the defects that occur. With a good fetal echo, almost all the defects can be detected. This is the normal, and you can see on the left, upper left corner, you can see a small hypoplastic rudimentary left heart. On my right upper corner is the atrioventricular septal defect forming inlet BSD, a large ASD, and a common AV valve. On my lower left corner, I think um, with this thing, I don't know where to keep this. Just a moment. On my left lower corner, this was a co-optation because of the, um, no, sorry. This was a small RV because of pulmonary stenosis. There is asymmetry of the ventricles. Sometimes in cooperation also, you may find a small LV and uh, that actually makes us, uh, it makes us imperative to find all the Z-scores and the flow velocities in the arches and all. And uh, cardiac rhabdomyomas on the right lower corner. Why is this not working? Yes. So uh, this is, um, again, the normal three-vessel view from the left to right pulmonary artery, aorta, and the SVC. And you can see this is tetralogy with very narrow pulmonary artery and branch pulmonary arteries. And this is transposition three-vessel view where because it is one, it is not uh, in the normal crossing um, disposition, it is either side by side or one above the other. We have a single vessel in the three-vessel view. So I will end my talk by just saying that we must not forget the neurodevelopmental issues. All over the world, there is a lot of uh, studies on uh, neurodevelopmental issues. Hypoplastic left heart and TGA have shown that, they have shown that these two lesions especially have got issues with brain development. And it may start from in utero also. So delays in cognition, language, visual, and motor skills may be there along with problems in memory, Children may have ADHD and autism, and that neurodevelopmental follow-up is very important in these children even later, because initially it may be normal, but these defects may develop later on in life. So to conclude, a thorough assessment is essential, especially even in the clinics, we should assess the saturations, the femorals. Palpable femorals does not rule out a co-optation. Subtle signs like feeding issues, and persistent tachypnea, especially after feeds, are hallmarks of some critical lesions. Pulmonary blood flow and PA pressures will be definitely, as it has been already, it's an established fact that these are the major factors for operation. Effort intolerance is important in older age group. Again, surgeries and procedures is completely individualized, especially in complex lesions. A long-term follow-up is necessary, not only from the cardiac point of view, but also from the neurodevelopmental point of view. And of course, fetal echo is the kaleidoscope of the future. 
So thank you very much for having me here. Thank and you very much, Dr. Devadetta, for this excellent presentation. You made pediatric cardiology so easy. I'm sure there will be very hot discussion. Now I would like to request all uh, panelists, Dr. Rashid Ayubi, our uh, guest pediatric cardiac surgeon from India, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammad Suleiman, senior consultant pediatric cardiologist, Kids Heart, Dr. Samir Sajwani, senior consultant pediatric cardiologist from Suleiman Habib Hospital, Dr. Mahmoud Asrofi, senior consultant pediatric cardiologist from Al-Jalila Hospital to join us. I'd like to request Dr. Kalpana Sengupta and Dr. Amir, our moderator. Uh, Dr. Kalpana Sengupta, well known to everybody, secretary of the pediatric club and Dr. Amir, member of the executive committee. Now I'd like to uh, request Dr. Kalpana to start the discussion. There will be a very uh, hot discussion having eminent uh, pediatric cardiologists in the panel. Thank you very much. Dr. Uh, Rashid has not joined. Please start, Dr. Kartman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saurabh. Uh, first and foremost, I must thank Dr. Devadatta for this absolute master class on uh, congenital heart diseases, which was also a visual treat. So uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Devadatta. Uh, I would like to start this discussion um, by asking uh, the other panelists, we'll give Dr. Devadatta two minutes to rest. And uh, maybe may I ask Dr. Suleiman, um, are there any preventable causes of congenital heart disease? We have seen so much. So let's start with prevention and then move forward. So uh, by that, I mean, are there any maternal factors which might contribute? Um, can, can something be done for that? Um, Can I just... Uh, yeah, Dr. Suleiman. Actually, Dr. Suleiman. I think... Dr. Suleiman. Dr. Uh, yeah. I think Dr. Debata wants to say something. Oh, actually, I think Dr. Rashida jo has joined, but I think he has not joined through the panelists' link. Um, I'll Mr. just try Fadi, to please, the uh, please make Dr. Rashida UB as a panelist. Sorry, Dr. Suleiman, please continue. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, you know, in congenital heart disease, um, most of the uh, causes that we still don't know and we don't understand where it's coming from, uh, the genetic factor, few genetic factors that now we know, uh, they are contributing to congenital heart disease and a few syndromes that we know that could lead to congenital heart disease. So, you know, patient with uh, day Georgia as an example, or, uh, you know, proper testing of genetic testing before marriage or before conception uh, may be indicated in some cases. But unfortunately, uh, the majority of congenital heart disease until now, we don't have a way to prevent it. Now, what I can say, you know, um, probably the best thing we can do now is to expand our expertise to go to detection, early detection. And uh, uh, what I mean with that is doing fetal echoes with expertise, um, you know, who can detect, diagnose, and properly uh, counsel uh, the parents for the future. Um, unfortunately, until today, we still see many, many patients all of a sudden out of uh, the blue that where they come to the emergency room with a very, very bad uh, um, uh, clinical uh, condition. So diagnosis, early diagnosis, a few cases that may be detected, uh, prevented, and uh, early diagnosis will be the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Sajwani, uh, Dr. Uh, Suleiman touched upon the need for a good fetal echo. So normally the anomaly scan is being done at around 20 weeks, so if I'm not uh, wrong. Uh, do the, is the echo done by a pediatric cardiologist everywhere or uh, the radiologists also opine on that? Um, Dr. Sajwani? Dr. Sajwani. Okay. Uh, he doesn't hear me, I can, I can elaborate if you like. Yes, doctor, if you can go ahead. Uh, because I think I am one of the people who's doing many fetal echoes, and uh, I think Dr. Mahmoud al-Sufi also, he may elaborate as well. Uh, but uh, 
currently there is a few in the country pediatric cardiologists who's doing uh, fetal echo. Uh, as a professionalism uh, of um, how we detect, there is a few doctors in the whole country, I'm talking about UAE, who's doing fetal medicine as a general. And most of them, they assume the responsibility of the diagnosis of fetal echo. And subsequently, they may decide to send the patient to pediatric cardiologist or fetal cardiologist, or uh, maybe uh, uh, decide to follow the patient on their own. Uh, but uh, uh, we see really very much less patient with fetal echo. However, when we get them, we probably diagnose them. I think, uh, you know, our accuracy from our expertise probably will reach about 98% uh, for accurate diagnosis of congenital heart disease, which leave us only with a few uh, congenital heart disease that we don't uh, uh, diagnose on time. Right. Thank you for that answer, <clears throat> doctor. Uh, Moving forward, uh, so uh, prevention and then baby is born. Now, uh, the neonatologist, what should they keep in mind so as not to miss a congenital heart disease? Maybe Dr. Dr. Sejwani. Dr. Rashid also has joined us. Welcome, Dr. Rashid. Sorry, please. Welcome, Dr. So maybe Dr. Yes, uh, Sejwani uh, can yeah, give us can. a few. Yeah, can you hear me? Clinical point. Can you give us a few clinical pointers on uh, yeah, how yeah. a neonatologist should not miss CHD? Well, uh, uh, murmurs is one of the obvious uh, findings which prompts the, any doctor to ask for an echo. In addition to that, uh, uh, any uh, desaturation, low oxygen saturation, and uh, in addition to that, uh, any uh, respiratory distress, which uh, doesn't match or doesn't clearly explain uh, by the X-ray, uh, and uh, any weakness in the pulses, uh, uh, changes in the upper, lower limb, uh, lower limb uh, blood pressure. So generally. Uh, need to keep like a high uh, suspicion whenever there is any uh, unusual presentation or uh, for, uh, in, the, in the baby's condition, an X-ray, uh, unusual cardiac shape or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, vascular markings and, uh, and so on. Sure. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to add anything to it? What is uh, most important? I can, like, I, can add, I can add one thing, um, unless there is somebody want to say something. Um, currently, what we miss, really, we don't miss this patient who raised the red flag, like saturation or like, uh, you know, respiratory distress and so on. We miss the normal baby, the no looking normal, the one that we send to home feeling good. And this patient, some of them might have critical congenital heart disease, ductal dependent or some sort of, and then this patient will come back in a few days later dead um, or near, you know, in the emergency room in the last breath. What we, what we uh, have adopted and most of the world have adopted is the screening on the 24 hours after birth. And the screenings that they depend on the lower extremities and upper extremities, basically looking at lower saturation and looking also at the differences. So we have a standard line like above 95, this red, green and the blue 90, that's red. So the red loses saturation less than 90, that's the red, you need immediate uh, consultation. And then you have between 90 to 94, where you can say this patient that I will watch them for one or two hours before I call Dr. Sejwani or Dr. Sufi. Um, we are far from India, we can't call anyone from there. But uh, um, you know, this is the way that we, we, we think about how to detect early congenital uh, heart uh, disease and subsequently make proper uh, action. Uh, may, I, may I add uh, a point here? Yes. Uh, yeah, now screening uh, can, the only thing or one of the things which can be missed is uh, coarctation. And uh, in the past, it used to be like, a, uh, like, a, like accusation that uh, the neonatologist 
he, he missed it and then there will be like an investigation and so on. But now it has become to an agreement that unfortunately coarctation can pass through all the screening uh, uh, and all the, even the most uh, accurate uh, neonatal examination. So now uh, I don't know what's the idea of the, of the panelists and uh, uh, maybe Dr. Dibadat, uh, that, uh, that uh, and now I know that in some countries they do echo as a screening. And uh, in that case, maybe uh, they are like replacing the stethoscope with a, a, a probe. So in that case, but with uh, otherwise with all the efforts, you will miss, uh, especially coarctations at and you can, uh, you can miss them in a critical coarctation who will come collapse and you cannot uh, save him. And also you can miss a coarctation uh, which will come later on with uh, hypertrophy, hypertension and so on. So I don't know what's the idea, what, uh, because there are some countries, I think uh, they are doing like screening echo for everybody. Yes. So, uh, I want to ask Dr. Suleiman about the importance of MRI in diagnosis of congenital heart diseases, because he has some experience, good experience in this area. Yes, uh, just let me comment in Dr. Sajwani and then I will go back. Unfortunately, you know, as for us, we are more fortunate as a pediatric cardiologist to have the echo in our hand. But I think to have it as a standard uh, um, for every single person uh, who is born, that will carry a lot of, of a lot of people just to do echoes. A lot, a lot, a lot of people, and a lot, a lot, a lot of costs. Uh, so far, uh, that's not um, indicated as a general rule. Um, I know some people like in Russia, as an example, they will screen the baby for heart, they will screen the baby for, with a neurologist and so on. But as a general indication, it's not uh, uh, really uh, needed. Going back, uh, you know, we depend more on the physical exam and we need a lot of training to train our fingers how to hold and touch the femoral pulses. Um, you know, uh, for a newborn babies, just to train your fingers to touch the, the, the pulses, need a lot of determination and a lot of uh, persistence that I'm gonna feel the pulse or I'm not gonna feel the pulse. And then I, I have a suspicion about the pulse and, and so on. Um, uh, as for the cardiac MRI, um, in newborn, you know, um, we started the program of cardiac MRI in UAE, I think in 2012. And we have done over a thousand patients for cardiac MRI. Usually we don't need it much in newborn because we have a very good echo that will show us almost, almost all the detail of congenital heart disease. Sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes we may need to add a CT. Occasionally we may need uh, to do a cardiac MRI. However, in older children, you know, patient as an example with uh, tetralogy fellow later on in life um, and other congenital heart disease as well. We use the MRI as a, a great tool because it really teach us a lot of things, especially about the volume, about function, about regurgitation, um, you know, all of this kind of uh, needed information to do a cardiac surgery in the future for this patient. Yeah, may I add something? Uh, thank you, Dr. Sleiman. Thank you, Dr. Samir, for the uh, previous comments about how to detect uh, the congenital heart disease uh, antenatally and early in the newborn, which is can cover more than 98% of almost all congenital anomalies. Uh, to do a routine scan for every newborn before discharge, I don't think this is an in, there is a strong indication unless there is a risk factors either antenatally or by uh, physical examination. Now for the coarctation itself, you know, it depends on the severity of the coarctation, as you know. Mild coarctation, yes, it can be missed. And um, this is well known. Uh, duct dependent coarctation, usually you have discrepancy in autosaturation between upper and lower. 
when the, 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 the arch is tight and uh, the duct supply the descending of water. So um, uh, you, you, you may detect some discrepancy in auto saturation in upper and lower, even when the pulse is okay. So don't depend on the pulse. Sometimes you have good pulse in the femoral uh, arteries because of significant right to left shunt, but the saturation will be definitely lower than upper saturation. Yes, yes. Finally, uh, uh, to, to have like an investigation about such a cases, uh, I think the committee which should judge about uh, such a, uh, let us say, a, a mistake or misdiagnosed uh, should be aware about the hemodynamics, the, the nature of the congenital anomalies. Otherwise, you cannot invite anyone who has a little experience about uh, 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 the nature of the congenital heart disease. When you have the duct open and the fresh newborn, then after a couple of days, the duct closed and sim symptoms started. So yeah, you may miss something, but with careful examination, um, uh, most of the uh, newborns now coming after five days or uh, one week to, to start the vaccination or routine checkup. So you may double check also the vital signs during this visit and just to catch up any missed, let us say, the, the diagnosis. This is what I want to add. Just uh, one moment, actually, um, about the blood pressure thing. Actually, I've seen in older children sometimes um, measuring the blood pressure in all four extremities, it is not uh, uh, that uh, is true that in, uh, ideally in a typical case of coaptation, the blood pressure will be high and the upper extremity, there will be a disparity between upper and lower extremity blood pressures. But uh, it has been, I personally have seen that in there were two or three cases of tacharysis arteritis where the entire aorta was absolutely thinned out, uh, the abdominal aorta and part of the thoracic aorta as well, so the descending thoracic aorta. So in those cases of tachyosis arteritis, the BP was in the lower extremity, which was around 98 by, uh, say, 50, and in the upper extremity also, it was not much difference. There was This, this is a personal experience. We, I think these are three cases of tachyosis arteritis where there was not much disparity in the blood pressure in the all four limbs. Uh, why it happened, I don't know, but it, it was like that. And, uh, um, so I, I can add one thing on, on the matter of uh, checking the blood pressure. You know, a lot of it has to do with, with mechanism that we are doing. The, the uh, staff ability to measure and properly listen to the blood pressure and uh, uh, you know to the stethoscope and make a proper uh, judgment. So if if you have a suspicion, I think uh, you know almost on all the teenager that's like almost the starting point different in blood pressure in upper and lower uh, extremities in addition to the femoral uh, pulses. So confirming the blood pressure that we feel is a very important thing. I can tell you about recent experience that we have a baby um, recently in the American hospital, um, a newborn baby and has hypertrophic or left ventricle hypertrophy. And initially when I scanned that patient, I thought this patient may have a bumby and the ATG did not show like a bumby there. There is a, a um, um, inter uh, ventricle uh, obstruction and everything was like, okay, there is no coarctation. There is, you know, the patient subsequently uh, improved a little bit. And then we did a CT scan just because we couldn't figure out what's going on with him. And then we found a coarctation in the aorta, in the descending aorta, almost in the abdomen. And that patient subsequently, you know, um, uh, was kind of uh, 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 treated for the hypertension and the situation um, uh, improved he still have that coarctation. And there was a definite high blood pressure in the upper extremities compared to the lower extremities. So proper measurement for the blood pressure, I think it still have a good value for us if we did it in a proper way. Right. So uh, moving on um, uh, in the neonatal age group, uh, as we understand from Dr. Devadatta's uh, lecture, 
identifying a duct dependent lesion is of utmost importance. So uh, when should we suspect these lesions? Uh, if uh, Dr. Devadatta would like to come in. Uh, as, I, uh, as I described, it could be like, usually what we find is that initially the children were okay. It may be that as long as the duct was open, usually the duct is open for 24 to 48 hours before it goes for a functional closure. So in the initial part, the children were okay and the babies were okay and there was no other much of a finding, but uh, uh, then once the, the, they crash, once the duct closes, once the uh, around 48 hours or so, or maybe at 72 hours, maybe at the end of a week, they start collapsing. So like the four DDs I said, sepsis, metabolic abnormalities, respiratory issues, and cardiac issues, this should be kept in mind. And uh, of course, they may uh, they will have cyanosis, and there may be discrepancy like between pre preductal and postductal saturations where they may be uh, widely differing, more than five to ten percent, more than five percent or more, as described by Dr. Al Sophie. And um, also, there may be other features of ductal uh, patients. But usually, there is no murmur like. Usually, they are not having much of a <clears throat> So, uh, my question to Dr. Rashid, uh, from surgical point of view, uh, which are the uh, congenital hearts that need an early surgical intervention? Uh, good evening, all. Uh... Very nice question. Actually, Dr. Devdatta has already pointed about what all surgical or what all congenital cardiac conditions can be treated or should be treated soon after birth. The most important uh, for cardiac surgeon being those conditions where the patient has symptoms and 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 the and the condition is uh, is not compatible with life, like TGA, obstructed TAP, VC. These are the conditions and is given hypoplastic left heart syndrome. There you have to intervene as early as possible soon after the diagnosis. Also to Dr. Sophie, yeah. Dr. Sophie, which congenital heart disease need early uh, uh, interventional uh, catheterization procedure? Uh, thank you, Dr. Amir. Uh, let me add uh, one point to Dr. Rashid. Uh, the, as you know, uh, the decision to, to go for cardiac surgery. Uh, as you know, it's a team decision, number one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, number two, it's, it depends on the, the nature of the anatomy. It depends on the, it's multifactorial, the body weight, the experience of the center. Uh, all those points should be discussed together to, to decide, shall we approach the patient surgically right now or we have to reach like a certain weight stage to, to have a better outcome. Uh, this is number one. Number two, uh, this, this will be part of Dr. Amir's uh, question answer. Sometimes we may go for like a palliation intervention just as a bridge to let the patient to grow up and reach a certain body weight to have a better uh, outcome. Or even you can bypass, let us say, one of the surgical stages. Like now, nowadays, we can uh, replace the PT shunt by duct stent, which can, can be done du during neonatal uh, age group, uh, which uh, good outcome, less, let us say, side effects. Uh, we can do, even for hypoplastic left heart syndrome, we can do hybrid procedure. We can stent the duct. We can do bilateral BA band, and nowadays even we can implant like pulmonary flow reducer inside the cath lab to 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 uh, to, to bypass or to, to cancel it. I say the the normal stage and let the patient grow to reach a Glen then Fontan later on. Um, what we can do else? We can do a lot of uh, intervention when uh, there is an indication to do it. This is what I want to say. If there is an indication to go for the procedure, we have to go for it, either interventionally or surgically. 
We can do Russian, we can do uh, cork uh, ballooning, we can do uh, doctor stand, we can do um, uh, critical AS, critical PS. Um, so it depends on the uh, anatomy, it depends on the uh, patient uh, demands, it depends on the hemodynamic status of the patient and the center experience. Yes, you're right. Um, so, uh, this is about the interventions that you spoke about, Doctor. I just want to know whether uh, in your, at your center, uh, these things are being done that you just spoke about. Uh, um, I'm proud to say we, we, we can offer most of the in, uh, neonatal interventional uh, procedure in our center, uh, like what I have mentioned, Doctor Stent, Rashkin, Critical AS, Critical PS, hybrid procedure, uh, BFR, pulmonary flow reducer, uh, hybrid. Uh, we did also some uh, VSD device closure, like a hybrid uh, procedure as a combination between the surgeon and the interventionist. Um, yes, we, 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 we have done a good number of neonatal intervention until now. And hopefully in the coming days, we'll, uh, our experience will be more and more to cover more aspect of such type of complex anatomy. Uh, Dr. I'm uh, interrupting the background noise. I would like to request Fadi if you can uh, decrease that one so that because uh, there is a background noise. Please continue. Uh, I answered the question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, I have to mention very important point also. Again, it's a teamwork. To, to do intervention, you have to have a, a good team. You have to have a good surgical backup. You have to have a good ICU team to, 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 to take such a tough decision and to have a good outcome by the end. It's not a one-man show. Sure. Uh, uh, so. would, okay. okay. I would ask about the post-operation management of uh, complex congenital heart disease. I have uh, some ideas about that. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, we can uh, pose this to the surgeon. What are the important uh, post-op uh, criteria like uh, that we should watch out for or monitor for? Pardon? Uh, hello. After the surgery. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The post-op period in a complex congenital heart, what are some of the important uh, things to keep in mind to manage uh, these neonates? These are intensivist questions, ma'am. <laughs> we are the surgeons deal with surgery most of the time and our risk intensivists do the job after that. But it's the most important we see post-operatively is the, uh, what is the hemodynamics and what is the drain output, most important risk point of view from surgeons is the perspective. Okay. I, can, uh, I can elaborate more on this area. Uh, yes, you know, Probably the same thing that Dr. Sufi has mentioned. Uh, also, the intensive care work after the surgery also is a team work. It's uh, include the surgeon, the intensivist, the pediatric cardiologist, even the nurses, the whole staff, they are part of this uh, team that you need to look for immediate uh, problem that will affect the child, how he will pass through the surgery, and that's very important question. So the, the, the cardiac output is the first thing for you to decide. And then you have to look at this patient, are they intubated? And, and if there is any complication related to intubation, any uh, issue related uh, to bleeding, any issue related to infection, any issue for patient with complex congenital heart disease that they have what we call it QPQS balance, especially let's say Dr. Sufi have uh, implanted a PDA uh, stent and then that we open the door widely for the pulmonary uh, artery and pulmonary bed to receive a lot of blood and then subsequently the patient will be initially you know more satting and then but his lung is getting more wet so there is a lot of work especially in the first 24 hours to 48 hours immediately after birth and proper management proper observation and early detection of any problem that happened that will make a whole difference of success for everyone. 
including the Absolutely. surgeon, the cardiologist, and the intensivist. Yes. Absolutely, I totally agree, Dr. Sleiman, uh, what you have mentioned uh, about, and this is a beauty of the teamwork. This is a beauty of the pediatric cardiology, let us say, to understand the anatomy, the hemodynamics, what's going on right now in this patient, why this patient needs a shunt or the stent, and another patient, both of them, they have tetralogy. One of them, they need a shunt, another one needs to, to band, for example. So you have to understand the anatomy very well, the hemodynamics, the current hemodynamics. Yes, the surgeon will do the job perfectly, but the, the, the journey will not be end at that point. Uh, uh, the, uh, the intensivist also, we have to follow if there is any change in the hemodynamics, the, the team will rejoin to discuss and take the right decision as uh, Dr. Suleiman mentioned. Thank may you. I, may I just make a small comment? Uh, it is uh, like Dr. Sophi and uh, Dr. Suleiman uh, correctly, very rightly pointed out. It is uh, every center, it is important to know the hemodynamics of that particular lesion. Complex heart diseases can present again. With it, a lot depends on the anatomy, especially the branch pulmonary anatomy, the lung pressures, and the lung blood flow. So we have uh, specific guidelines. Dr. Rashid himself has formed few guidelines for his unit. So for every lesion, we have separate uh, protocols also. Like for a BT shunt, the uh, saturation uh, levels should be, we will not let it go above say 90% or so, we should not, we should be aware when it falls below 75% or maybe from 80% onwards, we are a little bit worried that why is it falling? It's main thing is the trend. Again, it's not an absolute value, it's a trend of it. So we keep an eye, the, uh, the excellent team of nurses and uh, uh, physician assistants, uh, junior doctors also, they keep an eye on the trend of the events, the saturations, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the drains, everything. It's a trend of the events, and also we have definite protocolized uh, things that for petition, for Glenn, these are the important things we have to do. Even for ventilation also, the intensivists uh, have their own uh, set of uh, directions. So when that uh, thing happens, then uh, like we follow those guidelines. Basically. For example, in Glenn and all, you cannot let the PBR go very high. So we have to ventilate with low pressures as much as possible, something like that. Sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, having discussed a few of the important cyanotic uh, congenital hearts, uh, I would like to now move on to the common things that a pediatrician uh, would come across. So uh, maybe Dr. Sajwani can take this uh, question about VSDs. Uh, when do we uh, send them for an operative management? what kind of uh, intervention, depending upon what type of VSD will require device closure or open heart. So if you can just enlighten us a bit on that. Yes, uh, to start with majority of VSDs, they, uh, they are harmless. Yes. And they are generally regarded as a benign uh, uh, condition. And uh, many of the VSDs will uh, shrink or will close uh, completely, uh, spontaneously, without any treatment. So then you are remain with a small percentage uh, which uh, will not shrink or maybe they will grow with the baby and, uh, and they will be symptomatic either from early or uh, maybe you'll see that uh, they are not early symptomatic, but later on will have some uh, complications like uh, Dilate, the, like volume load or maybe sometimes uh, prolapse of some of the, uh, the nearby surrounding uh, valves, mainly the aortic valve. So uh, in, in summary, the, the most VSDs, uh, they are harmless and they will close or they will remain small or they will shrink. And even those, will, even those which will not close, they will uh, they they uh, they will be harmless for for they might be there and but you can uh, they won't have any consequence or any effect. Now talking about those which will have either uh, symptoms or will have findings on the echo which are worrying. Uh, these we start with uh, medications, and if we see that with medications, we cannot reach a good control. 
uh, or sometimes we try to buy time by medication, hoping that by time they might shrink. So if we cannot achieve a good control or uh, the child is not growing, then we send them to, uh, to be closed. Now, whether it will be by uh, cath or by uh, surgery, then it depends on many factors. Maybe Dr. Mahmoud can answer this question uh, better than me, and depending on the weight and the position and so on. Maybe Dr. Mahmoud can answer yeah. that. Part. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Samir, uh, for the comprehensive answer. Regarding now uh, how to close the VSDs, of course, if, uh, if there is an indication, we have to select what's the best way to, to close the VSD. All VSDs can be closed surgically. <laughs> this is uh, as simple as that. Now, how to close or when to close a VSD uh, by cardiac cath? Most of the muscular VSDs, let us say, can be closed by cardiac cath. What's the uh, ideal way? Five kilo and above, you can, you can do it. This is in general. Of course, again, it's a case by case discussion. Even we close in 3.5 kilo. Uh, uh, in our uh, uh, hybrid lab. For the perimembranous VSD, you have uh, to be careful. The, the case should be evaluated uh, by the team. And uh, if, if you have uh, suitable anatomy, uh, of course, to have a, a, a small tissue below the aorta, it will be more supportive to, to, to place the device successfully. Mm -hmm. However, even sometimes with almost absent aortic rim, but if you have like a small pocket aneurysmal tissue where you can put the device in, yes, you can give the patient the patient chance for device closure. Uh, uh, of course, if uh, uh, if the patient has, for example, aortic rigors associated with. Uh, uh, subaortic VSD, the, the procedure will, will be a little bit tricky, and we do prefer uh, most of the time to send those patients for the surgical closure. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Suleiman, uh, from pediatrician's point of view, we would like to know that if we come across a case with VSD, uh, how often should we uh, send them for a follow-up uh, to the echo? Uh, how often is it indicated? Uh, um, first of all, you know, um, it's a work of a team again uh, between the pediatrician and the pediatric cardiologist. We look at the initial uh, hope that from the pediatrician that they will hear this heart murmur, they will look at special symptoms for the patient, specifically uh, when related to weight gain and being tired and so on. So when they send the patient to us, uh, initially we look at the size and that's a big deciding factor. It's small, it's moderate, it's large. So if it's small, you know, I'll ask them maybe come after three months or six months or longer or you know, shorter according to Sometimes I may see them a little bit uh, uh, um, in a shorter time just to educate the parents more, to make them understand, because any time you talk to the parents about congenital heart disease, no matter what it is, it, it's the um, biggest thing that for the parents, you, we talk to them about small ASD that has no significance, but I still have to tell them about it, and then they cannot sleep for a week. Um, same thing for the VSD, so sometimes I may need to bring them back for counseling, uh, of course, if the if VSD is moderate, you know, we'll see them more often, make it sure, you know, moderate or large, we'll see them more often, make it sure the patient is uh, growing, he need medication, we are treating him. Uh, the pediatrician will sometimes, I even tell them, you know, go to see, um, you know, your pediatrician uh, and after two weeks and come and see me after one month. So I will make it like a balance between the pediatrician and the pediatric cardiologist follow up. And then when the time comes, you know, when I start the medication, then we will decide about the potential surgery uh, uh, or any other method uh, for that patient. Thank you. There is a question from some audience about uh, arrhythmias, the most common arrhythmias associated with congenital heart disease. Any comment about that? Um, do you... I can, I can give my own experience first. 
Um, first of all, the most important thing we understand in congenital heart disease, and this is a far, very common mistake from all of us, and from the parents' perspective, from the doctor perspective, and even from some pediatric cardiologist perspective. When you have a congenital heart disease and you cut the chest and you cut the heart, do not say the patient graduated. So this patient will come to see you with one single exception, maybe to a PDA. Otherwise, all of this patient will have a long-term problem related to congenital heart disease surgical repair. And that include many things, you know, a residual shunt, congestive heart failure, arrhythmias, um, you know, uh, and so on. Arrhythmia is a big factor and sometimes, sometimes it show immediately after the surgery. And usually it's what we call it supraventricular uh, tachycardia. And this is one portion of supraventricular tachycardia is a very bad one. Usually respond to treatment and then after the treatment, it will go away. And then you have the residual uh, uh, scar in the heart down the road, especially with patient as an example with tetralogy of follow and they have dilation, they have regurgitation, and they have changes in their atriums and ventricle. And this patient subjected to some serious, serious arrhythmia, such as, you know, ventricular arrhythmia. And that could, I, I remember one of my first patients that I saw in almost 35 years old, a man who collapsed suddenly out of nowhere and he has um, um, uh, tetralogy follow and then he graduated, he became 18, nobody following him anymore. Um, he think I am adult and he's uh, married, he has kids. So and suddenly he died because of, we do not keep following this patient in the long term uh, properly. So any type of, going back to the question, any type of arrhythmia could happen include uh, SVT or supraventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, and even six sinus, what we call it six sinus class. syndrome, which basically the sinus nodes sometimes go fast and sometimes go uh, slow, in addition to heart block and so on. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Sleiman. Uh, just I want to add one, uh, one point uh, <clears throat> for the arrhythmia and congenital. You have mentioned um, in the excellent way the arrhythmia post-op. But of course, there is sometimes high risk uh, of arrhythmia in special uh, type of congenital heart disease. Dr. Adibata mentioned uh, one of the CCTGA with complete heart block, which is, um, I mean, and let us say native arrhythmia uh, with a congenital heart disease. As you know, Epstein, they, 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 they have much higher risk to develop supraventricular uh, tachy, tachy arrhythmia comparing with uh, normal uh, uh, heart patient. Um, any dilated chamber, uh, it will be like an irritated chamber. That means if you have an ASD with dilated right atrium, SVT, it's suspected. If you have uh, pressure overload on the ventricle, some VTAX or abnormal rhythm, also it's suspected. Yes, there is a risk in Brica, a pre procedure, and there is higher risk after the procedure, even. Thank you. May I just add to a small thing? Just uh, I have seen in many cases of heterotaxias, a lot of arrhythmias are associated. For example, when you have a left isomerism, we, we have a, cases with left isomerism, then uh, presenting with ABSD and presenting with a complete heart block. And also there are many cases where we have multiple atrial ectopics, especially in these cases of uh, heterotaxias and isomerisms. Yeah, so, right, isomerism mainly. Yeah, yeah, that thing is also. Hey, in job, I want to ask one question supporting Dr. Sajvani. In some cases, echo is must. I'll give you an example. Cases of Down syndrome, whatever it may be. I mean, examine the heart, not the examine. Echo is must. This is Dr. Suleiman's dictum. First way he presented, he said this thing is still I remember. In Germany, when they, they, they I mean, for the, I will give an example for developmental dysplasia of hip. Now it is a routine ultrasound of hip should be done for all children, irrespective of anything. Now, my question is, of course, a day will come, Dr. Sajbani's uh, statement will be true, echo will be done for everybody now because the, uh, this uh, mobile echoes are coming, which uh, it will replace the stethoscope. Now, 
my question is, what are the condition echo is mass irrespective of clinical findings? One example is down. Maybe any other for pediatrician like me, I should not miss any cardiac lesion because Down syndrome, I have uh, experience. So I mentioned that Dr. Uh, Suleiman also said, any, any of them, though, I mean, panel. Yeah, panel. I think, uh, I think uh, each child, if we are, we maybe we agree that not every baby born should have a screening echo, that's maybe impossible. But I think each child should have a, an echo at some stage of his, uh, his life. So if you are a general pediatrician and you are, and there are, you are following a child from his, his birth, uh, you, uh, and I think it's good to get an echo done for him at any stage, because uh, there are definitely some silent uh, cardiac conditions and some of them are like devastating, like uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which can uh, present in sudden cardiac death. Uh, and, uh, and what I saw from my experience that uh, some of these children, because you have ex examined them uh, many times, so when they come back to you, maybe you will not pay so much attention to the, to the murmur. So many of the congenital heart disease are discovered when that, when that child changes uh, pediatrician. Then he goes to another pediatrician for some reason, and then he finds a murmur and he sends him for echo. And sometimes he finds a, there is like a silly finding, maybe a small ESD or even a PFO or a PDA. But then uh, the, the doctor feels bad that he has missed something. And sometimes, unfortunately, more than that can be missed. So if not screening each and every baby at birth, uh, of course, that's. Uh, but it's uh, the children who have been, who have grown under your hands, uh, who is under your hand from his, from since he was born. So I think it would be good to have him echoed at some stage, even if he is completely, completely having no signs and no symptoms. Can I just mention one thing in this perspective? That is in our center, we have started, uh, like uh, the pediatricians have started referrals for um, even if there is problems in other systems, like, you know, the small hand deformity that was there, the child was having a borderline saturation of 95 to 96 percent, but ended up being a like a like a severe complex congenital heart disease. So now they're very aware. And even if, if they have renal issues and all, uh, uh, they will refer the child for a screening echo. So this has become a dictum in our center now. That any other issues also, especially renal, then uh, associated with limb abnormalities or thoracic deformities, they do refer for an echo. And of course, if there is other features of this one, uh, Recently, I've come across a case who I've referred to Al Jalila Hospital, who was a boy who I think is two, three years old. And uh, he had uh, some, I think, respiratory cough. And the doctor, who is a very senior and very famous pediatrician, who has been following up this baby since he was born. So she referred him to the hospital, and he did an x-ray done. And uh, the x-ray showed that the heart is on the right side. And then uh, the echo showed that the the right pulmonary artery is absent and uh, maybe dr mahmoud uh, if he came across was involved in this patient so then the second step was to do a ct scan to search for a pulmonary artery which can be uh, salvaged or can be stented to encourage the growth and the better prognosis in the future so and uh, so so, okay, maybe you'll say it is not cost effective or and so on, but for each pediatrician and for each parent, their child is, uh, uh, is you know, is the worth all the world. Uh, let me just comment in Dr. Sejuani. Um, um, it's very nice really to have an echo for everyone. It's, it's, it's a luxury for me. It's a, the way that I'm going to get rich fast. 
um, and retire early in my life. But please now, don't, don't, don't send the complex cases to, to me, huh? <laughs> and, and just keep the clean cases for you. By the way, I did the CT for that patient you are talking about, uh, Dr. Sejwani, and uh, yes, he, there was an absent of the right pulmonary artery. Let me go back to what we uh, are talking about, you know. Uh, I just want to clarify the thing for the pediatrician. Um, currently, the term of screen and echo does not exist. Screen and echo per se does not exist. There is an indication for us to do an echo, indication not screening. Screening mean we are going to do screen everyone for COVID. And let's come up with some people. So far, we don't have the luxury in medicine. Uh, uh, again, we may come to it at one day, but currently we don't have. Um, this is, you know, alternative. There is no alternative, no alternative to good medical practice. A good medical practice include, you know, the doctor who's gonna listen to this patient, gonna listen and differentiate between the right and the left. Regardless of how famous I am or how famous he is, if I don't hear the sound in here or I sound to hear such question, my, you know, a lot of us as a doctor, we are being pushed a lot of time to see 20, 30, 40, 50 patients. And with that, the detailed physical exam and going to the most basic thing that we learn in our medical school, we skip it. We skip the murmur, we skip the pulses, we skip the blood pressure, we skip the high risk factors, we skip the family history of sudden cardiac death, we skip, we skip, we skip under the pressure of, so what I will say probably the best thing for us is we'll just go back to the basic things and then subsequently decide who is gonna need an echo, who's not gonna need an echo. I can understand, I can understand, yeah. you know, that everybody, uh, uh, you know, deserve an echo and this is the word for me. But remember, there is people who's paying for this cost. And these people are either the government or insurance company, and they will go bankrupt. And um, and and uh, um, and maybe the parents themselves. When I tell the parents that the echo is going to cost you a thousand dirham, we just like basically is going to hit their head for it. It's a lot of cost and a lot of money to just make it a screening at this time. By the way, uh, echo cost I think four hundred dirham in Astar or in Prime Hospital. And the other thing is that when something is missed, then people look uh, like retrospective and whatever that poor general pediatrician careful was he, he will be pointed as, as he was, he missed and so on. Because this is, so uh, I think uh, uh, many, many times we came, we came across, I remember once, a mother insisted that I should do an echo because uh, he was referred because the radiologist has a small doubt and the insurance didn't cover and I couldn't hear any murmur. So I told the mother, don't worry, uh, I'm sure there's nothing. And I looked at the x-ray and I was uh, uh, not worried. Then the mother insisted that she said, uh, she started crying, then I had to do the echo and then there is a like uh, it's sinus bronchus uh, AST. Uh, I remember my teacher, they used to tell me that uh, a BSD, there should be a murmur. And I, my teacher himself came across a BSD which, where there was no murmur. Which, so, so we are in the real world. We cannot ask everybody to be every time ABC accurate, looked at the pulses, looked at the murmur at the right side. This is the real world. And I think uh, if uh, it's not uh, now, when uh, if we do more echoes, maybe the and we are more screening echoes should not be considered like a complex echo for a patient post op with Fontan, and you want to decide whether to do a surgery or not, and so on. So there should be like even I think in many hospitals they have screening echo where it won't cost as much as the real. Uh, echo for a complex heart. Uh, just, a, just a question. I, I am going to let Dr. Mahmoud also comment on this. You know, if you tell the insurance company I'm doing a screen and echo, uh, echo you're going to be rejected immediately. So there is no, su no such thing for them. I'm talking about the insurance. If you told the parents, 
I'm going to do a screening echo, they may pay, but it depends on them. What I'm trying to say, who's going to carry the burden, okay? And what is the benefit? I can look back as us as a doctor, all of us, all of us, pediatric cardiologists or neurologists, or there is no one, no one of us can say I did not miss anything in my life. None, zero. Every single person have missed something. And if you said, no, I didn't miss, then I will question that if you are practicing or you already retired. So all of us has missed something. You will miss something one day. I will miss an ASD, I will miss. But again, this is part of the whole process. It doesn't change the current recommendation how we deal with things. Maybe in the future we will change, but currently there is guidelines and there is way that we are doing something. Until that change, we will keep practicing in the, in the most feasible way. I don't know what Dr. Mahmoud uh, will say. Yeah, I, I totally think this agree. is a very hot topic. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Doctor Sajwani. It's, it's it's really a very hot topic. Yeah, I, I can summarize actually. To 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 miss some something silent, it's suspected. Uh, but don't miss something major. Yeah, you cannot miss a, a, a clear cyanosis, let us say, or harsh murmur, or. Um, um, uh, even if the parents ask for echo, I, I think this is an indication. You can go for it. I'm, I'm, I can tell you from my own experience, I close an ASD in 60 years old, 60, 60. Do you think this patient did not uh, go through a lot of uh, internal medicine doctors or even cardiologists? Yes. So you can miss something silent or a little bit silent or not that obvious. Even sinus venosis, Dr. Samir, if, if it is a small and there is no clinical science, I, I, I do agree. Maybe the radiologist discovered something. And this is an indication. So again, we went back to if there is an indication, go for it. If there is no clear indication, I don't think we have to do it for everyone. Indication, Dr. Uh, Sohrab, you have mentioned for Down syndrome. Yes, it's, it's recommended for Down syndrome as a screening. This is an indication. So indication, either clinical, either risk factors, either even, as I mentioned, parents uh, uh, request. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Doctor. Is it so, it in India? Is it, is it, do you do screening echo? Do you think they can the term, do screening The term is accepted <laughs> there. Do you think they can you do only it? have one billion plus. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting I don't know how long it will take you to screen them. So I would be in the hospital now. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, so in which cases you, you do, I mean, which, suppose as I am a pediatrician, uh, I may miss these cases, which I mean, I mean, maybe miss. Like I, I told one example, don't. What are the other cases apart from this limb abnormality where the echo will diagnose, which I will miss? I mean, if you have example, down is one, any other condition like that. Like uh, that, that I must do echo, I must do echo, irrespective okay. of clinical findings. Irrespective of clinical findings. Family history. Like we might miss uh, uh, obvious, uh, like from the cardiac point of view, should I say? Yes, yes. yes. From the cardiac point of view, like we can miss systemic or pulmonary venous anomalies very commonly, especially a pulmonary anomalous venous connection. Maybe a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection may be missed. Small ASDs may be missed. Then um, also, um, like if you are not considering, if you are considering a relatively normal clinical examination, you are trying to say, I think, um, a small coact may be missed and arch anomalies may be missed. So those uh, arch anomalies, uh, they may not have symptoms. Sometimes they have dysphagia in the um, newborn period, but sometimes they may not have any symptoms also. So those can be mixed. That's what I remember. You can thank you. Thank you very much. Just going back to you, uh, are you doing screening echo in, in India? 
Do you no. do uh, anything in a, like, you know, just normally for whoever uh, passed by? No, I, I, it's a, definitely ours is a referral based practice, but our pediatricians are, have a very, very sensitive ears. Uh, they can pick up very small mamas. I've seen the senior pediatricians, they have become, like, they pick up mamas which I cannot hear sometimes. The grade two mamas also, they can pick up, like the co-op patient I showed. Actually, we didn't get a chance to measure the BP because the pediatrician was uh, in the OPD two uh, rooms beside me. So the pediatrician referred me the uh, baby saying that this child has a very soft mama, will be discharged today. Please have a look quickly before discharge. So I quickly did the echo and then, then I found the severe cooperation. Then we went back and measured the BP to be very honest. But in a busy OPD, uh, measuring BP in all four limbs may not be possible all the time, but uh, that that is what is it? It's a referral based practice always, and uh, sometimes they have chest pain also non specific chest pain. They get referred for chest pain, which most of the time comes normal. But there have been incidences where I have picked up myocardial bridges, and they are on aspirin now. So uh, those uh, small, small things are uh, there that uh, makes us. Can I, can I make an um, uh, um, admit to something to make Dr. Sajwani happy tonight? Um, you know, uh, I, I can tell you that I get, we all get many heart murmur. And I can tell you, I have listened, I can differentiate the innocent heart murmur to a certain degree, almost 99 point something, to a pathologic heart murmur. Now, I can tell you also that I do echo for that patient under the concept, not screening, but a heart murmur, while I know what I'm gonna get down the line. Now, you can ask me why you are doing that if you know it's, a, <laughs> it's an innocent heart murmur, why you are doing it? I will tell you a simple thing because the parents want it, just like Dr. Mahmoud al-Sufi stated in the beginning, Whenever you put something in the parent's head related to the heart, unless you give them back a definite answer, a definite answer. So if you don't want to echo them, don't tell them about the heart murmur. If you tell them about it, then it's for them, a bomb is going to explode at any given minute and it will make the whole family disappear. So, so I so, want to interrupt you here, Dr. Uh, Suleiman, yeah. sorry, Dr. Kalpna. Um, some of the patients they have come to us, they, they have been diagnosed as an innocent murmur on echo. But they said, we have been asked to repeat echo every one year or so, just to follow. Is it, I mean, a guideline to follow uh, innocent murmur by echo regularly? There, there is no such thing, it's named innocent murmur by echo. Okay, so that term, innocent murmur is a stethoscope finding. Echo is a normal anatomical real finding. So whatever I see in the echo, that's real. It's not a suspicion. It's not a controversy. It's, it's done deal. I may not see something or see something. That's a different story. But whatever I see the echo, when I say the echo is normal, then the heart murmur becomes just a sound that has no value from the cardiac point of view for, compared to the finding of the echo. And we never follow them. Uh, nevertheless, this happens. So uh, uh, I can tell you, I, get, I, I can tell you the same pediatrician refer the patient back again to me <laughs> after two years or three years. Oh, the echo has come back. <laughs> so, you know, so it's a concept from the family, from the pediatrician and so on. We just need, you know, to develop some relationship between us. So right now, I think we can leave this uh, topic behind because I don't think there's a consensus as of uh, date. And uh, uh, we will move forward. Uh, from pediatrician's point of view, I just uh, would like to ask uh, maybe Dr. Mahmood, uh, uh, is there, what is the latest on the infective endocarditis prophylaxis uh, for congenital hearts? Uh, it's a good question, actually. Um, according to uh, last recommendation from American Heart Association, there is a few indication only for uh, to give a prophylactic antibiotic for congenital heart, like for example for cyanotic 
for those who has a residual shunt after repair, for those who has a previous history of uh, infective endocarditis, or the, if they have a foreign body like device or prosthetic material inside the heart. However, uh, in my own experience, and I think we, we had this discussion before in pediatric cardiology club in one of the uh, uh, previous old meetings, uh, I think it's a case by case discussion. It depends on the, uh, the anatomy. It depends on the, uh, the, the hygiene status of the patient and the hygiene status of the, the area. So I cannot compare the American guidelines with a bad, uh, let us say, health condition here and there, yeah? So you have to respect your hygiene status, uh, hy the, 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 uh, the procedure, what you want to do in your institute, according to your experience, according to the, uh, uh, the, the education of your team. Is it really perfect to, to say no? no need to give a bacterial endocarditis or you do prefer to give because this and that. So yes, there is a guidelines, but I think we have to design our own guidelines according to each institute. Not to be over, but we have to be fair with our patient. Dr. Slima, you want to I add something? Can I ask you a question, Dr. Uh, please, please. Yes. Just to comment on this. Do you remember the last time you treated? Yeah endocarditis following dental work as an example. Do you remember the, the, the few cases we discussed in our meetings? Yes. The patient who came from nearby who, who, who had a dental procedure and he has a simple VLD, ended up with multiple vegetation inside the heart and outside the heart. And this patient was operated and had a tough course in our ICU. So, uh, this, this is one of the recent patients, maybe last year, and there is maybe one more or less. But again, this is, we are talking about UAE. Let me tell you something. I was on one of the uh, poor countries last, uh, last month. I have seen plenty of rheumatic heart disease. Can you tell me when you have seen a rheumatic heart disease last time here in UAE? maybe years ago. But when I saw such type of really, I mean, uh, major complication and still present here and there. So that means you have to design uh, special guidelines for those. Same for bacterial endocarditis. I think it's, we, we have to, 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 to create our own protocol according to each area. I, I believe uh, from my uh, own perspective, um, you know, I really kind of uh, follow the guideline, current guideline that we are following uh, on most of us. Uh, Absolutely. More or less, really given the endocarditis um, become the exception, not the standard. Before it was the standard. It doesn't mean that every single patient we're gonna sit down and discuss the case, you know, the dentists, they need work. They have a lot of patients with congenital heart disease, some of them already repaired, some of them already not repaired, and so on. So they need a little bit of guidelines that for them to keep going on with their work. We don't sit really and discuss every single case, like in a CAD conference or in a, you know, it, it will, the, the, the point is that what we know that even if you give the prophylactic antibiotic, even if you give it, there is no proof so far that from the literature that we have from before all over the place, that it will prevent the endocarditis. You may still get the endocarditis if you are given it and so on. So yeah, in general yeah. term, I think at this time, we don't practice given endocarditis. We practice exceptionally given endocarditis. Do you, do you, accept, do you accept that statement, Dr. Sophie? Yes, I do accept uh, 100%. But uh, again, I, I want to mention also one very important point we have to understand the type of the procedure you want to do. So now before circumcision, they mm -hmm. want to ask, is it uh, uh, bacterial endocarditis indicated or not indicated? So there is a certain procedure you have to ask about 
the indication for prophylaxis or shall we give a prophylaxis before those certain procedure or not? Not every uh, simple procedure you have to give bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis. Correct. Basically, it's limited more or less to yeah. feet extraction and upper airway, specific upper airway. Let us say uh, more invasive. Work. Okay. What is the uh, practice regarding this in India, Dr. Devadatta? We follow, uh, in, at least in our institution, we do follow infective endocarditis prophylaxis, as uh, Dr. Alsofi just said. In all those cases, uh, we do follow it. Because uh, ours is a, like he very, very uh, correctly pointed out that the guidelines which is set in another country like America, their health standards are different. And our health standards are different in the sense that there may be places where they're maintaining very good hygiene, but there may be people from the rural areas who are not aware also sometimes. So in that sure. case, to maintain a uniformity, it is good to maintain the infective endocarditis. I, I can add also, I can add also one single point that, you know, uh, previously widely used antibiotic have its own risk and its own problems and its own side effects, including, you know, resistant, including uh, allergy, including uh, uh, other uh, uh, complication, a rash, and so on. So it's not really, you know, I'm just going to give uh, a milligram of amoxicillin and move on. Uh, there is other thing that may, might come up with it. So that's why, you know, we fade away from using it as a standard. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether the surgeon is still with us. There's a question, oh, audience he, question. Uh, he, he had one urgent work, he left, he apologized. So continue. Right. So maybe from uh, uh, the pediatric cardiologist experience, they can tell us that, uh, there's a doctor who wants to know, is there a specific body weight above which uh, uh, the, the surgeons would take up the child uh, in case of, I suppose, elective cardiac surgery? Uh, do they insist on a certain specific weight? Uh, I think uh, uh, it depends entirely on the anatomy and the physiology and the hemodynamics more than the weight and the kind of a Intervention is decided on the natural physiology, hemodynamics, all together. No. So in cases where it is not very urgent to operate, would they still would want to wait? Because this happens often, uh, you know, I, yes. I don't know what like, is... Uh, elective, elective surgeries can be done. Like we do have our Indian guidelines where they have clearly stated like mod closing of the moderate yeah. to moderate size BSDs and all then moderate side is in on I showed those guidelines also. So they have their own specific timing on operation like a tetralogy, which is not that much symptomatic, you close by six months to one year. And if uh, if again it's a choice of the center, it's the choice of the uh, again the surgeon who's comfortable with doing the surgery at that point of time. Sure. Okay. In addition to the anatomy hemodynamics and pathophysi oh, sorry, the physiology and and the type of the surgery, of course. Okay. Um, the other question is, uh, what are some of the congenital hearts presenting as heart failure in older children? Uh, Dr. Suleiman? I guess um, it's not a specific thing to say. It's usually a missed uh, 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 diagnosis in the majority of the cases that I will assume that you have some VSD that you missed, uh, you have uh, some regurgitation, valve regurgitation that will lead finally to heart failure. Uh, you will have, uh, you know, such a, as uh, aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation. Um, uh, you could have a complete EV canal that's um, uh, as well missed. Um, I'm just trying to gather my thought. Um, <laughs> I can tell you the last, the last thing that you could say, the worst case that I, th I think in my life history that was missed is a Down syndrome patient that just went back to Dr. Sohrab. And that was, was not, uh, we missed even the congestive heart failure of it. And that's Down syndrome, 25 years old, came to the emergency room over 40 plus time. Most of the time come because of constipation 
or um, and that was in UAE, uh, constipation or uh, dermatitis. And finally, diagnosed with AFI canal and uh, pulmonary hypertension is Menger syndrome and so on. So I believe this is, you know, the thing that came to my mind, uh, the congestive heart failure or late stage. Uh, I don't remember seeing many. You know, you can say I see a anomalous coronary artery um, disease, late, late presentation, which is only about 5% of, of uh, the cases. I can see, you know, maybe um, associated related cardiomyopathy related to uh, some sudden either myocarditis or inherited and so on. There is many cases where the patient may come with congestive heart failure in later stage. Mm -hmm. What is the oldest uh, you have diagnosed with El Kappa? Uh, <laughs> El Kappa is uh, its own. Um, I think all of us as a pediatric cardiologist, as well as we feel always proud when we diagnose uh, Alcaba. Yes. And, um, you know, because it, it, you, can, you, you know, we feel proud when we diagnose something that we can make a difference. You know, when I diagnose something that I cannot do much about it, you know, and the patient probably already so, so late, uh, you know, most of the time this uh, uh, patient uh, uh, with Alcaba always, almost always get treated for a long period of time uh, with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. And Dr. Sufi, remember, one of the patients um, we did, uh, was in Latifa Hospital treated for many, many, many years uh, as dilated cardiomyopathy with Lasix and so on and so on. You know, this is only a few patients that, and finally, Dr. Sufi sent that patient to me to do a cardiac CT. And uh, surprisingly, that uh, uh, patient, uh, has a clear uh, alcab and uh, we had a surgery and he did very, very well, or she did. I don't really remember. Do you remember what was the EKG finding with that patient, Dr. Sophie? Actually, uh, the EKG almost normal, unfortunately. Almost normal. Yeah. So that was a very, very unusual case yeah. of uh, 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 alcab. But it wa wa what was really, I mean, like, I mean, uh, alarming in this patient, uh, there was a dilated coronary artery. As you know, al -Kaba, you have two types, uh, the infantile type, which is present early in life, like heart failure, and you have the adult type. When you have a good collateral, the patient usually can grow normally, and uh, the patient discover later out of sudden. And there is a case report about al -Kaba in adults. Yeah. So uh, when, when you have a good collaterals, no symptoms, usually no ECG changes, and al -Kappa will be discovered out of sudden during maybe PTCI for uh, chest pain. Uh, the adult cardiologist inject, and he found that there is only uh, I mean, one coronary supplying uh, the, the two main coronaries. I think, um, I think it's, uh, just let me add one comment before we uh, move from this, because I think this is a very important as a cardiologist. It become like almost kind of a mandatory for us for any patient with dilated cardiomyopathy to make it sure 100%, not just 99.9, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And sometimes we even push for CAT if the CT, we think the CT will not okay, answer us so. or if we're gonna do something for the patient anyway. So any cases of dilated cardiomyopathy, almost a very, very important to exclude al kaba because you can fix it. You, you can make the patient go back to normal. But in the case that you just mentioned, uh, Dr. Suleiman, would uh, 2D echo not have picked it up? Why was a cardiac CT necessary? I think, you know, I'll, 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 the coronary arteries are the, probably one of the most difficult one to do in echo. It needs a lot of practice. It needs a, a good machines. Uh, I can't just say the cardiologist, also the good machines. If you have an old uh, machines that uh, some hospitals still have here in UAE, um, uh, you probably will not be seeing uh, 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 the patient and then high suspicion. As an example, part of the protocol in pediatric in our clinic, and I believe in uh, Jalila and uh, many other uh, hospitals who deal more with pediatric uh, patient, that we have a clear cut. You have to report the coronary artery origin. And I have, you know, my technician, as an example, when I review the echo, I have to make it sure that I saw the coronary artery. If I don't see it, I will have them come back you know, if I do it my hand, then it's fine. But if I, if they don't show it to me, I'll ask them go back and do it again and again until they find me the answer. And with time, they know that I'm gonna ask them for it. So they, 
they just do it. They, they don't wait for me to send them again. Right. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether you remember there was a child that uh, we suspected and you confirmed Dr. Suleiman uh, at one year of age, he presented to us with cardiac failure who was diagnosed to have Al Kappa. Yes, uh, yes, however, he was uh, following up regularly, very regularly to a big center, big pediatrician and was repeatedly being treated as, um, uh, you know, asthma. So uh, uh, this was... Uh, an eye opener to us. So, as a pediatricians, we don't want to miss these cases. So, what are the early indications uh, that you know uh, we should suspect? Somebody comes in cardiac failure. Yes, we will investigate them and probably find out. But uh, what are the early symptoms uh, of Al Kappa? Where I should ask for an ECG at least to see whether classical changes are seen. I think I'm going to satisfy this to Sajwani again tonight. <laughs> uh, <probably. laughs> uh, do a screen echo. No, no. Um, what I will say, you know, uh, from the pediatrician, from the pediatric cardiology, we diagnose a dilated cardiomyopathy. From the pediatrician, we diagnose the bronchiolitis. And it's, it's uh, I think, from the beginning, almost all the newborn usually always admitted with the bronchiolitis until finally somebody decides to do an EKG and then subsequently they say there is, if they know the EKG, they will say there is a standard thing. And I advise every pediatrician to, after this meeting, we go and look uh, at the EKG, be familiar with it. You could make it only once, but when you make it, you know, you're gonna make a, you know, it's a very clear cut. So I will say this is the, probably the, you know, if you have a patient who has frequent bronchiolitis um, and frequent asthma and frequent you have to suspect not just the, the Al-Kaba, but other finding, you know, like a vascular ring, double arch, and, and so on. So I think it's, I don't know if it's clearly justified, uh, but I think this is, will be part of the uh, screening where Dr. Sajwani will be happy. So may I interrupt here? Can we modify this that the children who are presenting as bronchiolitis to have at least one ECG? Not echo, at least ECG. <laughs> I, I think uh, ECG, ECG won't give you the answer. And uh, it won't be very, very, you can do even ECG and you will miss it. Uh, so I think if you will notice that we can go on and on and on and on and talk about missed cases, missed cases, missed cases, missed cases, and so on. And if you go to the adults, you will find even more and more talk about. And there is a big topic, uh, which is sudden cardiac death. So uh, we do screening in many things. And, uh, and uh, now technicians in the adults, even in pediatrics, technicians, they do echo. And they are very good. And uh, by time, everywhere, actually, technicians, they do echo. And then by time, uh, and many of them, they are doing even better than the doctors. The doctors, by time, the cardiologists, they, they become le uh, detached. And maybe the technicians now, can do, many technicians can do echoes better than uh, doctors. So going back to uh, this missed case, missed case, missed case, and so on. There's a doctor asking whether in every case of infant of diabetic mother should undergo a TB echo as a screening procedure. Sure. <laughs> yes, that's, I think we followed up in many, many places. Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, that, comment, comment in that. Um, even before birth, infant of diabetic mother, exactly. type one, it's mandatory, uh, uh, basically part of a guideline. Also another one, we frequently, uh, I will advise every single uh, pediatric cardiologist or pediatrician or whoever come to a patient with IVF, they always have high risk for congenital heart disease. Instead of 1%, you are talking about 5% or 3% or 4%. And when this patient come with congenital heart disease, there is a lot, a lot of disappointment for uh, the family. So yes, I will say the mom with a diabetic, especially type one, type two, we don't have a clear cut that it will increase congenital heart disease per se, but definitely for type one, it's a, there is the increase about five fold for congenital heart disease, especially with transposition and hypertrophy uh, cardiomyopathy. What about uh, sibling, sibling of uh, an index case with uh, congenital heart disease? 
Um, you want to comment, Mahmoud? I don't want to keep commenting. Oh, what do you mean? Uh, shall we screen them? Or, yes, or shall or we not? screen them? Uh, again, Is it there depends. An increased it depends. incidence. Yeah, it depends on the, yes. the, the nature of the congenital heart disease. All cardiomyopathy, we do recommend uh, family screening, for example. If uh, there is a genetic uh, disorder behind, let us say, uh, this uh, congenital anomaly, yes, uh, we, we, we do recommend family screening. If there is, I mean, uh, more than one member in the family, uh, or high, very high risk family, yes, we do recommend that. But it's not routine for every family who has one patient with a congenital heart disease. Uh, these However, are exactly the uh, parents who are very anxious and would want this to is, get it done. Uh, again, you know? the indication, uh, parents request is a standard indication yes, for everything. Do it. Uh, Muhammad, you uh, want to add something? Yes, uh, I will just say, you know, going back to the fetal echo, because we are missing this area. If you have any child, and this is part of the pediatrician work and part of our cardiologist work, if you have any child with congenital heart disease, especially left side lesion, more than the right side, yes. it's uh, recommended to do fetal echo in the proper time around 18 to 24 or after or before, it depends on the cases. So if you have a patient with VSD, then the mom next time carry a little bit higher risk if she has uh, aortic stenosis, then the risk become very, very high, like about 10%, 15% instead of 1% in the general population. So any congenital heart disease, the subsequent pregnancies, it's recommended for you to uh, uh, screen uh, these patients. I, I think the, the mother uh, herself, she will ask for fetal echo next time. Yes. <laughs> And the father risk, even if the father is father, yes. uh, having a congenital heart disease, yeah. you still uh, recommend to uh, 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 to do a, a fetal echo and the proper time. Fair enough. So we got uh, some of our answers not to miss CHT screen, diagnose, treat. Now uh, they have been treated, surgical treatment has been done. How do we follow up or on follow up with pediatrician? What we should keep in mind anything specific that you would like us to remember. Uh, maybe Dr. Sufi can take that. Yeah, uh, um, again, I think uh, Dr. Muhammad Suleiman already mentioned that uh, this is a lifelong disease. It's not like a one, uh, one station treatment and uh, everything was done. So uh, it depends on the complexity of the disease. If it's a simple AZ, simple VSD, usually, uh, we, we, we do follow them for a couple of, uh, let us say, months. Then if every, everything uh, became normal, no need to be followed. For more complex cases, it depends on the nature of the disease and the type of surgery which was done. For example, tetralogy, TGA, uh, definitely for hypoplastic left heart and more complex cases, lifelong follow-up. What we have to follow as a, you as a pediatrician, you have to follow the growth of the patient. You have to follow the vital signs, for example. You have to follow if there is any uh, uh, warning symptoms, uh, the, the uh, neurodevelopmental uh, growth of those patients, as uh, Dr. Dibata have mentioned, because more complex, more intervention, means more risk to have, uh, uh, I mean, neurodevelopmental delay of, uh, on those patients. No, uh, this yeah, this is what sorry. I want to mention. Uh, we still I... wanted in India and our panelists oh, so, also, you know, I'm a doctor, uh, Sufi is uh, just yes. reached, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm more tired from airport. Uh, Dr. Suleiman is in Egypt, uh, Dr. Sajwani, uh, Dr. Dibadata, I want to be midnight in India. I think last question also asked, we will uh, close Yeah, we yeah, are actually... Dr. Sohrab, just let me uh, add one thing. I think this is very important to add it to Dr. Uh, Sufi comment. Uh, there was, you know, for post-op follow-up, there was a study that was done, a major, major study. They did 35,000 plus for all kinds of congenital heart disease started from mild to moderate to severe. Mild, I'm talking about ESD and VSD that was repaired. And the whole general population that it depends on the degree of the disease, 
they found that they have eight times risk of sudden cardiac death yes, as, yes. As, as a follow-up for it. And that's a major, major increase, eight, eight, eight folds increase. Even in the symbol ASD and BSD that was repaired, there is still have about four to five increase in the fold of sudden cardiac death. So the general, the general uh, um, uh, perspective that this patient in, for a pediatrician, anytime you open the chest and you see a cut in the chest, Please ask the family, are you following with pediatric cardiologist? And they should tell you yes. And if they say no, then you should send them to follow with someone. Never ignore that cut or that, the, the, what we call it the surgical, surgeon signature or the cut on the sternum. Never ignore it during your physical exam and during advising the patient, no, you need to go back, see the pediatric cardiologist, even if you already repaired and everything is okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, doctor, we can conclude. We have gone through Thank almost you all very the questions. Much, Dr. Dibadeta, Dr. Sajwani, Dr. Suleiman, Dr. Uh, Sufi, uh, Dr. Rashid also because he had Arjun Bok, Dr. Kalpana, Dr. Amir. And more than 400 something is still there following us uh, from throughout the world. I would like to thank all the viewers. Um, sorry, our panelists are very tired. I mean, it's midnight in India. I would like to thank everybody. It was excellent. I mean, uh, discussion will go on till morning. I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank Fadi and Tofiq for sponsoring. Final note, Dr. Kalpana, we'll close. No. <laughs> Same thing. It's uh, been a very stimulating discussion. And thanks to all the panelists. And uh, uh, I think uh, you have given us some future direction. Now uh, we will plan some debates for and against. Uh, we had one already inadvertently on screening. So it was very nice. Thank you so much uh, for your contribution. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Dr. Sora. Thank, Thank you to everyone, everyone who contributed. Thank you to all. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Kalbana. Thank you. 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 Thank you.